We'll begin with apologies, and at this stage we've received apologies from Trevor Lunn. Any other apologies? No. Okay, none that we're aware of. Uh, we do know that uh, Emma and probably George are going to call in by Starleaf, but unfortunately just at this minute in time they're just outside of the meeting until we start that section in a few moments and then they'll join in. Draft minutes. Uh, of the meeting held on the 18th of November at page 5 of the meeting pack. Are members content that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings of the meetings? Oh. Okay, I shall take that. That's okay. And they are signed and good to go. There's no matters arising. So um, we can move to item 4, which is Brexit issues and a oral evidence session with the Joint Directors Committee on European Affairs. Members of page 12 to page 368 of the meeting pack are the relevant papers. And just to let you know that a response from the Executive Office to our request for an update on the level and type of engagement between TEO officials and the Irish Government and the range of issues under discussion is at page three of the table pack. Um, I say we're pleased today to be joined by members from uh, the committee. Um, at this stage, we have, I hope, uh, Deputy Joe McHugh as the chair. Uh, I think people are just populating into that. There are another number of names in there, so I'll hope that he has indeed still a few more people joining in. I can't read it. Can you read the top line there for those names? Neil Richmond and Rory O'Murray. Oh, no, there's a line above that again. <laughs> The, the very, oh, very, the very top. top. No, I think it's something about Marie, is it? No. What does it say on? Oh, sorry, no, I what do we like? Austin. George. <laughs> uh, no, it's your line. Just says we're in the reason. You asked me to read that. Uh, I wore glasses for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a number of members in now. I, just, I don't see the chair. The chair hasn't. Um, how many can we get up on the screen at one point? Oh, heaps of them. Oh, yeah. There he is now. Sorry, there we are. There we go. Yep. Oh, perfect. So we uh, now have the chair of the committee on the Starleaf system. So Deputy Joe McHugh, are you there? It's dropped out again. <laughs> Even if you just go through the... Back out again. Yeah, he doesn't realise it's not on. I suppose it would be silence. fair to highlight that this is the first time that we or any committee, I believe, has done this. So I, I will since expect a few teething problems for the first few minutes whilst we get people settled on. Um, just read the names. Yeah. Know the list. Yeah, just for the record, then I'll list the names of people that we're expecting for the meeting. Um, I say, along with Deputy Joe McHugh's chair, we have Deputy John Brady, uh, Deputy Marion Harkin, Deputy Neil Richmond, uh, Deputy Rory O'Murha, uh, Senator Vincent Martin, and Senator Sean uh, Kogan. So hopefully that will have given a little bit of time for Deputy McHugh to get his table sorted there, which we can He's see, we can see his table, so that's a good start, we just hopefully get him the other side of it. Is that mute? We um, also have our we also have uh, committee members Emma Sheeran and George Robinson on by Starleaf and Christopher Stalford who has joined us, you're all very welcome. I'm not sure maybe Deputy McHugh if, if you can hear us, but we can actually hear you and see the table. Uh, maybe if that helps you to be able to position in the room for us to see you. And the rest of the deputies a phone number for Joe. <laughs> Is that on mute? Yeah. As broadcast and to take. Maybe if the communication team are able to unmute uh, Deputy McHugh there, if that's something that they can do. 
God knows what he's going to say that we're going to hear. Okay, so he's actually <laughs> saying he's he's on with somebody there. Right. He maybe expects it for quarter past, does he? No. No, two. <clears throat> Um, any of the other members maybe want to deputise at the initial stages for Deputy McHugh to, because to, I appreciate we've only got 40 minutes to, to undertake that. Is there anybody designated as a Deputy Chair for the Committee? Deputy Deputy. A Deputy Deputy. Hmm. Hello. Hello. Oh. <coughs> At least it's not a problem at our end for a change. <laughs> Class. I mean, both are bordering up. Um, Colin, if, do you want to move to uh, correspondence? Just to. Uh, no, we'll, we'll, we'll give them a second. He's, he's there. He's. Broadcasting could be. Reverse the camera. Uh, I think that's what he needs to do. Actually, reverse the camera and unmute himself. I want you using this excuse, Pat, to say this is another reason why partition doesn't work. <laughs> The Ulster Unionist appointed at each other. I'm glad to see it as a shinner, give them direction now. I was just about to say, Pat, it's a shinner to you, sort of out. Oh dear. No, we can't hear you. I and mean, like, we heard you when you came in. Like, can you see the three? Can you see the three things? The three, like the, the middle one for ending? That's wrong. If I shout that open by the his speaker, I don't want to interrupt them. Uh, could the communication team, could you uh, unmute Joe McHugh there, please? Uh, that's grand. Joe, we can actually hear you now. Can you just, can you hear us? Okay. Can you hear me now? We can yes. hear you. Yep, yep, that's perfect. We can hear you. We, we can't quite see you, but we can hear you anyway. You, you, you know what? Don't, don't worry about the seeing, because sometimes the seeing is, is, is believing. So maybe <laughs> I, to get things going, um, my, my apologies for being absolutely... Uh, completely technophobic here, and I'm really, really sorry for that. Uh, but I'll, I'll get things going, and I know we're, we're kind of tight for time and strapped for time, so yes. you're all uh, very welcome uh, from up the road. Um, I, on behalf of myself and the members of the, uh, the Oireachtas Joint Committee on EU Affairs, would like to thank you for the invitation to engage with you today. I am joined today by several members of the EU Affairs Committee, so I'll keep my opening remarks short so not to take too much time. Um, the members who should be online are Deputies Neil Richmond, Marion Harkin, Rory Moroku, Deputy John Brady also, and um, we have Senators Vincent P. Martin and Sharon Keoghan. The Joint Committee on EU Affairs uh, has listed Brexit as a priority item for consideration, so we welcome this opportunity today to discuss the impact of Brexit on Northern Ireland. Recognising the unique economic, social and political context of the land border between Northern Ireland and Ireland was always going to be to prove particularly challenging during negotiations. As we edge closer, closer to the edge of the transition period, it is now more important than ever to work together in prioritising and addressing the interests, stability and prosperity of the people and communities of Northern Ireland. Article 11 of the Ireland, Northern Ireland Protocol, as you'll all be aware, concerns the maintenance of continued North-South cooperate, cooperation in many areas, and we as a committee look forward to working with you to maintain this continued cooperation post-Brexit. Again, look, thank you for the invitation uh, to engage with you today, and we look forward to discussing these issues with you. So, look, I'll, I'll hand it over now to uh, 
uh, our colleagues in, 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 in Northern Ireland. Uh, so if somebody wants to lead on the questions and maybe to make it simple, I'll try and nominate somebody from our end to answer the specific question. Is that okay? Uh, uh, yes, that's perfect. Um, so it is, uh, we, we, what we'll do is, um, I, I'll start, um, Joe, with a few questions and then I'll pass to the Deputy Chair and then we'll open it out to members um, and we'll address the questions just via myself and then uh, they make their way to you. If you can nominate somebody, then that should be, make it easier for people coming in. Um, so look, if I could begin, um, I was interested um, this morning to note that the President-elect, Mr Biden, had said that there, there, he's really stressed the importance of maintaining an open border uh, on the island of Ireland post-Brexit. And in fact, he directly said that the idea of having the border north and south once again being closed, it's just not right. We have to keep the border open. And what I was interested in maybe was some perspective from yourselves about your reaction to that direct intervention by the president-elect and also the conflict, I suppose, that there is between his remarks there and then elements of the internal markets bill, which could potentially cause problems for that open border. So what's the sort of reaction from your committee and, and what do you see as the, the problems and solutions to that? Okay, Doug, um, I pass you on to Neil Richmond. Neil, do you want to take this? I know I'm putting you on, on the spot here, but look, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll do it this way if that it's quick firing uh, nominations. So apologies about that, Nate. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Chair, and um, thanks, um, Chair Ella Collin, for the question. I suppose the, que the comments late last night from President-elect Biden are, are nothing new. Um, he said as much prior to the election, and they're consistent with the comments of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, uh, the Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee in Congress as well. And to be honest, it's consistent with what has been signed up to by the British government and the European Union, and which is enforcing international law and that's maintaining the full implementation of the withdrawal agreement, including the Irish Northern Irish Protocol. Um, the Internal Market Bill does present quite clear challenges, Chair, and the European Union has not been quiet, and indeed, in relation to their concerns about it, the European Union has obviously commenced legal actions, have written to the British government, have yet to receive a reply, disappointingly. And we will note the amendments that were made overwhelmingly by the House of Lords in recent days, um, the ones in the names of people like Baroness Ritchie and others. <clears throat> and certainly um, there's two strands to it. The inter internal market bill as designed by the British government isn't acceptable. It breaks international law as per the Secretary of State. And indeed it's a direct contravention to the protocol within the withdrawal agreement. Either those, that section five of the internal market bill needs to be removed by the British government or more importantly, not put back in. Um, or we see what the ongoing negotiations lead to if this can be resolved in the in the trade negotiations but yes yeah, certainly the intervention by the president um there is a repeat of what we've heard before and uh, i think it's something that should be borne in mind by people across the eu and the uk okay thanks neil, neil okay doug go back over to you but I'll just jump in with another question there. Um, there was just one. Uh, I was interested in what preparations you have been preparing for in, in Dublin in terms of a no deal scenario. I mean, obviously there still is no no deal, and as yet we're we're just a number of days uh, from the deadline. Um, we certainly can't have much sense um, from uh, an, a, a north of any preparations uh, for a potential <coughs> no deal scenario, but. Do you get a sense that there's preparations been made in Dublin for such an outcome? Do you want to take that again, Neil? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Well, I think it's important, Chair, to bear in mind that the last two budgets in Dublin, both by this government and the previous government, were framed on the basis that a no-deal Brexit was unfortunately the likely scenario at that stage. So that's why you've seen quite a lot of advancements in terms of the expansion of Dublin Port. Taoiseach was there again yesterday. The expansion of Rosslare Europort in Wexford. The hiring and they're in place of customs official, officials, veterinary officials, and all the things that will be needed for the, the restrictions that will come from east-west trade. We have no responsibility for what happens uh, in Great Britain, be it at ports such as Holyhead or Dover. So we would have seen a, a concerted effort by the Irish government to work with shipping lines to encourage exporters to look to 
to look at direct exporting links to the continent, bear in mind that continental EU is Ireland's uh, biggest export market. Some of the budgetary measures we would have seen in, in the last few weeks that uh, businesses are able to draw down grants of €9,000 to engage with customs agents. Um, those study goes yesterday, the day before the Tonshta announced a new scheme um, whereby companies can apply for loans, microfinance loans up to €25,000 where there's been a 15% uh, drop in cash flow. It's, it's a combination me of measures, Chair, that you know began quite some time ago. We absolutely hope in the coming days that a deal can be secured. It is imperative for everyone, um, particularly those in the UK, for a deal to be secured. But from an Irish point of view and from an EU point of view, we are, as Ursula von der Leyen said this morning, we are as ready as we can be for a no deal. The Commission uh, published no deal notices quite some time ago. We very much hope they don't have to come into force, but if that is what the will of the British government is at this stage, then Ireland collectively, and it goes across political parties, it's not necessarily a government thing. Our Brexit omnibus legislation is commencing at th uh, the committee stage at 3.37 it's the um, this afternoon. It's the second piece of legislation to cover things uh, like um, uh, you know, bus travel on the island um, and all these other small matters that need to be picked up, um, social protection payments. So it's a whole uh, waft of activity that I probably in two minutes can't give a complete covering. I'm sure our secretary can give you a complete note um, where the joint secretary from Belfast could as well, but I hope we have given you a bit of a flavour there. Okay, thank, thank you very much indeed. So I'll pass to the Deputy Chair to Doug. Uh, thanks, um, Joe, uh, and your team for, um, for this. Uh, Doug Beattie, um, I'm the Vice Chair in Ulster Unionist Party, uh, but thank you very much for, for taking the time to engage with us. And it's nice to see some familiar faces there, and Neil, um, uh, who, who we spar with on a regular basis, and it's, it's, it's quite good fun. Can I just maybe pick up on something, um, and it will probably fall to, to Neil, but Joe, it would be nice to get your perspective uh, as well. I, I guess. Um, when you talk about Joe Biden and he's talked about that we, we, we want no uh, manned borders between North and South, and I don't think anybody wants that. I don't think anybody has ever talked about that, and we certainly don't want to see that. But can you accept and understand that the real concern with some members of our community here um, about the border that we're going to have uh, east-west? Um, uh, and it is a genuine concern. And when we have people talking about... Um, restrictions of foodstuffs. Um, is it fair to say, um, and we can talk about it as the internal uh, markets bill, uh, that the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, Article 16 safeguard, allows for unilateral action when we feel that there could be an issue in regards to um, foods or, or anything else which, which could damage our economy here in Northern Ireland? Okay, uh, Doug, and apologies for earlier there because I, I don't have the visuals, so I'm, I'm, I'm grap okay. grappling with voice and all that. But uh, look, uh, I know the, 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 the big questions that, that Neil co covered there in relation to legislation that were involved in last year and the focus on the border. I know uh, recent commentary coming from the United States, but one of the things that uh, I learned from certainly Nancy Pelosi's visit and uh, Congressman Neil. In, uh, uh, Richie Neal's visit, the, that message of the border and the importance of the border was taken taken back to, to the United States. And I think that has given uh, President-elect Joe Biden a lot of um, confidence in the statements he, he's making on the border. But look, I know there are issues also on, on an east-west basis. So look, I'll, I'll bring in, I, I don't know which members I have on the line here, but I think Ruri uh, Omorohu, Deputy Ruri Omorohu, do you want to come in on, on those issues raised by uh, uh, Doug there? Right. In fairness, like, I have to agree with an awful lot of what Neil said in, in the sense that, um, look, Joe Biden was only continuing on what has already been said by um, a huge amount of uh, and, uh, and Pelosi. Um, I suppose, right, in relation to the East-West relationship, I would state that any anomaly and any difficulties have been created by the fact that we entered into this Brexit process, you know, and uh, I assume if I was, I'm, I'm not trying to offend or anything, if I was a unionist, I'd say it's, from a unionist point of view, it's probably been the most destabilizing act that has been in relation to 
um, in relation to the union. Right now I have a particular view in, in relation to what is an actual solution um, to the entire problem on the island, but I assume not everyone in the room would necessarily uh, agree with me. And, and look, what we all want at this point in time is that there is actually a free trade agreement that all anomalies are dealt with. Um, I don't think it's particularly sound of a British government to go back on uh, on a deal that it's uh, the, on, on a deal that it's previously agreed with at, at international level. Um, I don't think it gives it a huge amount of credibility, and it creates a huge amount of difficulty. And here, uh, where I come from in the world, people are particularly worried that there would be any sort of change in relation to how their life how their business is, is going to operate. Accepting that there is already going to be changes in the best case scenario as regards customs and, and, and what have you. And, and like people will all look for workarounds and let's assume that a huge amount of people will not be prepared um, for January 1st, no, no matter what happens. But look, it's, it's as simple as this, the, the, international, the Internal Markets Bill uh, and any possibility of undermining the withdrawal agreement or the Irish Protocol is, is just not on in any way, shape or form. I have no difficulty with dealing with any anomalies, but see, see the difficulties that were thrown up originally by Boris Johnson. Um, I, I thought some of them had been basically cast aside by a, a, a number of uh, uh, spokespeople, uh, uh, you know, with it, within Westminster even. So um, I, I can see that this whole Brexit process creates a huge amount of difficulties for a huge amount of people. You know what I mean, and, and that includes people of the union's persuasion, and 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 also the, the likes of uh, people like me and uh, a, a border constituents. And just here, it, it, there's nothing good that I can see from anybody in Ireland in relation to this. Okay, uh, thanks, Rory. And, and look, look, I'm I'm deliberately not getting involved in these answers because I want to facilitate as many uh, people as possible, Doug. But just on a, on certainly on a on an interest in note from our deliberations as a committee with the House of Lords and we're due to meet with uh, members of the House of Commons in a few weeks time. Um, there's a real desire and uh, sense of focus in terms of you know working that relationship that east-west relationship and I know like a lot of there's a lot of unknowns come the first of January uh, but one thing's for sure that uh, whatever is needed in terms of that continuation of the dialogue be it on an east-west or a north-south basis I think it'll be absolutely critical okay um, I'll hand it back to you guys there now and uh, if there's somebody else what work willing to come in okay yeah thanks. I might yeah, have a comment Joe just okay. to directly yeah. respond to Doug's question and Doug I think it is important to reassure that those of us in Dublin or across um, the south we do concerns of um, all per persons peoples in Northern Ireland respect regardless of what community or none they come from and we appreciate that it is a serious concern and it needs to be addressed as such I think it's also quite important to put it quite clear that the EU has no um, ambition or intention to introduce flu food blockades or restrictions or anything in that regard. And the imperative of the coming days is to ensure that we maintain as much as possible, as much as the British government would like there to be, that unfettered access, north, south, east, west. But we have to bear in mind the terms of the Internal Market Bill, as it was written by the British government, are a contravention of that withdrawal agreement and that protocol. Quite a lot of effort went into devising that protocol, went into devising that withdrawal agree agreement that was negotiated by this British government, was ratified by this British Parliament, and the terms of it are binding. We absolutely want to continue the conversation on a north-south basis, and I believe there was a really interesting comment by your party colleague Mike Nesbitt at an online forum I hosted a couple of weeks ago that Joe, Joe McHugh attended, and you would have heard a lot of talk from Tisha Micheál Martin about a shared island, but it's also the shared island strategy. And that east-west relationship from a Dublin point of view is economically extremely important and we want to make sure that is as fluid as possible. But a lot of those decisions, though, quite frankly, are going to be come down from the decisions made in London at this stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you for that, Doug. Okay, next we're going to pass to Martina Anderson. Um, thank you all for uh, being in attendance at this meeting with us. Uh, it's good to have this uh, exchange of views. And I want to uh, state at the onset that when I was a MEP, one of the things I was acutely aware of and concerned of was the fact that we in the north of Ireland, not all of us that reside here, would be able to um, be afforded the EU rights 
post-Brexit. And to that um, end, I brought John McAllister, who was then a human rights commissioner, a former uh, member of the Ulster Unionist Party, and then NI21, to Brussels to engage with the Commission with regards to what would happen to our EU rights post-Brexit. And in a, an exchange of views and then a letter to me afterwards, the EU Commission confirmed that those of us who are Irish here in the North, um, whilst we will no longer reside in a member state, that we will nevertheless continue uh, to enjoy our rights as EU citizens and that we would be EU rights holders, but that would apply to only those of us who are Irish here. And therefore, when I, um, I was involved in ensuring we had a response to a consultation that was carried out by the Irish government in relation to the allocations of seats uh, for the south of Ireland, that we were told by the EU Commission that the eligibility for us here in the north, who are EU right holders, to vote and to stand as candidates in elections to the European, uh, European Parliament is determined by Irish law. So reminding us all what the former Taoiseach Leo Farrakhar had said, that no Irish government would ever again leave us behind. I ask you now that we're coming near the end of this transition, what is the intention of the Irish government to ensure our EU rights are upheld and that we will be eligible to stand and to vote as candidates in elections to the European Parliament because it's your law that will determine whether we will do that or not. Okay, uh, thanks, Martina. Um, can I pass that on to you, Neil? Thanks, Joe, and thanks, Martina. Um, it's actually quite important to talk about very good issues that you raise in relation to maintaining European rights and some of the moves that the Irish government have done in recent weeks and recent months in cooperation with our European partners to ensure that Irish citizens living in Northern Ireland will still enjoy the same European rights. So that's the same four freedoms in terms of the freedom of movement um, and everything else within the Union, but also things like um, being able to access the European health insurance Part. I just got confirmation on a parliamentary question from the Minister for Higher Education that um, they're rolling out the plan for students in Northern Ireland to be able to access Erasmus Plus post the transition period as well. And I suppose the interesting story about in relation to entitlement to running for the European Parliament, you know, that, that still is maintained, but voting rights, as far as I'm aware, and will continue to be not just in Ireland, but across all EU member states. Um, for the European Parliament is, is based on residency. You vote in the constituency you live in because um, you're voting on material matters that will impact where you live on. And it's the same argument that can be taken into um, votes for, you know, whether people in Northern Ireland shall vote for Ardall or things like that. Of course, as you know, the, this government, uh, in line with the last government, will be, it's parallel to the EU, will be um, when the pandemic malaise will be uh, proceeding with the referendum to extend presidential voting rights for all Irish citizens, regardless of what jurisdiction they live in. But I suppose that I've given you a flavour of and some answer, a partial answer to your question. It's not probably the full answer you want, but I think it's important to be factual and clear um, about what the status quo is at the moment. And indeed, the Irish government is continuing to progress this um, and making sure that those tangible benefits are there for all Irish citizens, regardless of where they live on this island. Well, I just think for accuracy, it's important that we all know that that is not the position of every member state. And in fact, Ireland stands out as one of the few member states that says that you have to have residency in order to vote. And that is where the opportunity for the Irish government to ensure that those citizens in the north, you only have to look at Cyprus, those people who from the north of Cyprus, who's under to Turkey control, that they can, say, they can vote in European Parliament elections. The same thing as here. And you've got an opportunity to do that. Thanks, Martina. I might bring in Rory there. Rory's indicating there as well. Uh, Rory, if you want to come in. Oh, yeah, no, no, girl, now you get to look. I, I, strangely enough, I'm going to back up um, <laughs> Martina in relation to this. Look here, Neil has said like of the importance and even the, the work that the government has done, and this will be between part of, I suppose, the 
do you call it, wider negotiations between uh, the European Union and um, between the European Union um, and, and the British government, but also certain bilateral agreements to ensure that certain projects will still be maintained, that um, certain cross-border operations will still be possible, and, and, and all of that. But look, if there's an acceptance that we should, um, that, that people who would claim to be Irish in the North, that they, uh, sh and all others, would be facilitated in relation to, to the rights um, as, as regards uh, provided by the European Union, well then, what one of those rights would be being represented. And I think Sinn Féin has done a piece of work uh, and got some, I think it was Mark Bassett, it was um, legal advice in relation to this, and this has been provided to the Attorney General. So I suppose we, we you know, the government should have a conversation in relate with the Attorney General and see what is possible to do, because we need to do the absolute utmost, not only to maintain those rights, but to ensure that people have representation and possibly a, a right to stand. Now, that might not suit everybody, and I, I accept that there will be political considerations, um, and I may vary with the government in relation to this, but uh, in, in fairness, it's already been mentioned what the previous Taoiseach had said, that he would never leave the North behind before, excepting that he had done previously, or that governments had done previously. Mm -hmm. I suppose the, 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 the critical importance of this is that um, under the terms of the protocol as we move forward, uh, we're going to be subject to the decisions that are taken in Europe, but we're going to be in the democratic deficit of not being able to influence those or have somebody that directly we can point to and say that's our representative there. And that will be going forward for, for many, many years where we will be impacted by those rules, those decisions, those determinations. Uh, and it only seems right that if we're to be impacted by them, that we should have some voice in shaping um, that, that policy and influencing that policy going forward. So. Um, it follows well. I, I'm going to pass to Pat Sheehan next for a question. It's good to be talking to you and thanks for this meeting today. Uh, Neil uh, preempted my question a bit. I wanted to ask about the European Health Insurance Card, Erasmus and Horizon. And I know Simon Coveney said earlier this month that he was working on, on, on some system whereby citizens here in the north wouldn't uh, be out of pocket in terms of uh, access to European health. So I'm wondering if you have any further information about what the, the practical outworkings of that will be for citizens here in the north who are European passport holders. And you mentioned, Neil, access to the Erasmus Plus. How is that going to work? And, and are citizens here also going to have access to uh, the research funding in Horizon? Okay, uh, but I'll, Neil, if, if you want to take the, the health one, can I just come in there on the Erasmus one? Because there's one I, I work closely with, with uh, uh, my colleagues in the Department of Education uh, this time last year when we were putting together uh, legislative, uh, pre preparatory legislative uh, um, uh, workings in the event of a no deal Brexit. And one of the areas which we were very, very anxious to get some sort of uh, uh, solution on was, was the Erasmus programme. And, and, and what it required was actually the higher education authority and uh, the authorities, the third level authorities in the north working closely and look there is uh, a potential uh, solution there where Erasmus can be facilitated on, on a northern basis and I think that just shows that you know with the willingness with, with that collaborative approach that, that we can um, have ha, ha, find solutions where, where we have difficulties. So Neil if you want to come in on the, um, the health one. Yeah, Gormagat, Gerlach, Agus Gormagat. Pat, just in relation to the European Health Insurance Card, that's currently a committee stage of the second Brexit omnibus bill to be taken in front of the Dáil this afternoon, uh, after which, probably about next week when it goes to report stage, we'll be able to work out that clarity um, for people in Northern Ireland to ensure that come the 1st of January, they will, of course, uh, be able to access the European Health Insurance Card. Um, and I suppose that's as, as good as an update as I can give you at this stage, but it is it will be something that the Irish government, with all our European partners, that we've got a full agreement to ensure that that's rolled out in time for the end of the transition. Okay, thanks. And just okay, thanks, Neil. See if anyone has any information on Horizon. Yeah, okay. And, and just, uh, I'm wondering, does anyone have any information on whether there will be access to Horizon, the, the research funding from the EU? 
So, sorry, Pat, yeah, that is the intention that Northern Irish uh, third level institutions will continue to be able to maintain access to Horizon 2020 uh, through partnerships, be it with the Republic or other countries. Um, those details, I know Joe's successor, successor as Minister for Higher Education will split the department, Simon Harris, um, hopes to make an announcement in that. Um, I, think he, I actually hope to do it by the end of this month, but probably another week or so, because it kind of a bit of it's tied on to the negotiations on the future relationship. But it's an overall package to ensure that those studying in Northern Ireland will continue to have access to Erasmus and Erasmus Plus, but equally that the institutions will be able to access Horizon 2020, because so many of those bids are joint bids be it between Queen's University of Belfast and Trinity College Dublin, or something else like that. But no, it is absolutely the intention to ensure that, that access is maintained. Okay. Um, Christopher. And now for something completely different. <laughs> um, I just just a, a few points that I, I want to make, um, more observations rather than particular questions. Um, I think it was established in 1911 that the House of Commons has superiority over the House of Lords. So amendments coming from the House of Lords uh, in relation to the Internal Market Bill, if the government decides ultimately the will of the House of Commons will prevail. And this is a government that was elected on the basis of uh, delivering the outcome of the EU referendum. It's also recognised that parliamentary sovereignty uh, trumps, for want of a better word, uh, international law. International law is a very nebulous concept, parliamentary sovereignty. And this is recognised even by someone like Julian Maughan from the Good Law Project. Mr Euro himself recognises the parliamentary sovereignty trumps uh, these considerations. Northern Ireland's part of the United Kingdom, and uh, I don't see how a protocol which places a barrier between Northern Ireland and its biggest market, which is the GB domestic market, can in any way be presented as good or reasonable or beneficial to the people of Northern Ireland. Now, I think that both sides are very clear. There's absolutely no desire for uh, border infrastructure, north-south or east-west. And east-west is important economically. North-south, less important economically, but important symbolically. And I get that and understand that. But I think that uh, ultimately, uh, I'm hopeful that we will arrive at a negotiated position that protects the sovereign integrity of the United Kingdom and maintains good relations north-south. And I think that that's what we all should be striving towards going forward. I don't really need a response as such, but given the uh, consensus that there was in the contributions thus far, I hadn't intended to speak, but I thought it was important to put a different viewpoint on the record. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's a much rounded uh, contribution if we have something from you, Christopher, so it's always appreciated. But Rounded or sounded? <laughs> I'll pass to uh, Joe if you want to, to maybe yeah, comment on that. Or? No, like, I know, I know you don't have anything specific to ask, but look, uh, I think you know we're <coughs> we've, we're at this, uh, I suppose now, you know, we've got to four years and, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's very easy to just, you know, pigeonhole into... Um, you know, one one side or the other, but it's it's a lot more complex than that. And one of the key awarenesses that um, Simon Coveney always had was, you know, that um, appreciation and awareness for, uh, you know, constitutional integrity and 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 trying not uh, in any way um, to to move into a space that that would provide, you know, would would create difficulties or any 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 problems in that regard. But it it, it is such a, a complex area. Um, I think it wasn't just uh, confined to the chattering classes as was maybe anticipated and for people in embassies just to have um, conversations over um, over over a four or five course meal but it really really has been such you know an in-depth and comprehensive debate at all levels right down to a community level and and you know when when we held a lot of those Department of Foreign Affairs, um, facilitated forums on a sectoral basis. Like it was really, really good. You know, and I remember being one in, in, at one in Letterkenny, and we had more people coming from Tyrone uh, uh, and, and the Derry side, uh, contributing from a business point of view. You know, outlining their concerns and their, um, I suppose, their worries and, and their fears. And, and I think at all times the government has been very, very conscious to to, to have at the heart of all these. 
uh, discussions and deliberations is is respect and and in particular the the, the constitutionality and uh, the sovereignty, as you mentioned yourself, there, Christopher, Christopher, the sovereignty issue. So so this is about people how they're going to lead their lives. Lorry drivers who are trying to figure out now what's life going to be like on the first of January, twenty twenty one, and how it's going to impact and whether it's a third level student coming from Dublin to Coleraine or coming from Belfast down to Trinity College, uh, how we can work those practical um, issues and conundrums which will raise their heads, uh, no doubt, from, from the 1st of January. And, uh, and like no different to the to the peace process, uh, going back over a period of 20 years, if, if we're not talking to each other, listening to each other, um, uh, and, and, and being open and, and then having respect at the centre of, of all these discussions, I, I, you know, we will not overcome the, the issues which will, ar will arise in the time ahead. Okay, just in response to that, I appreciate, I appreciate everything that's been said, and I think that it is um, a source of profound regret to me that an issue about whether or not we should retain membership of the European Union, and I'm not suggesting for one second that it has been by anyone in the government of the Republic of Ireland, uh, certainly not in, the, not in the government of the Republic of Ireland, but an issue about whether or not we remain in the European Union should have been used to, I suppose, raise much older tensions and divisions. And I hope that we can move on from that. Thank you, Chair. Can I get in there? Hello? Can you hear me? Is that, is that Senator Vincent P. Martin? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think Christopher's uh, message there, should, we should sit up and take note of it. I would respectfully agree to disagree, but that's quite irrelevant as a senator for the Green Party in the Republic of Ireland. The fact is that uh, Ulster unionism has not, don't feel they're assured. I, I agree to disagree, but maybe I've lost, or the people who believe what I believe have lost the argument. So I would feel more than of the best of both worlds. Uh, and it's not up for me to say this. I'm going to respect this a, a confident unionism could have cemented itself like never before. But the reality is where we are, that it, it's been, um, maybe it's the, the British government have failed to assure our fellow close neighbors like Chris and while I disagree with him, I thought he articulated it in a very dignified, clear way and left me certainly in no doubt in case I'm walking into a, 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 a utopia I dream about. I, I'm just convinced it's the pluralist approach, it is the way to go. Uh, a celebration of difference can cement those differences. It's the usual stuff that we're used to. I'm not sure Chris might agree with this, but like, in a religious term, it should be ecumenical. So if a particular religious group uh, wants to have their Sabbath on a Thursday, well, then we should facilitate, promote, tolerate the Sabbath on a Thursday because there's a celebration of vibrancy and strength in diversification. But unfortunately, it's now out of our hands and I hope that we can... Uh, make the best that we can in this situation. I'm hoping Northern Ireland will be in a magical position. Uh, I'm, I'm an optimist, the best of both worlds, but no threat without consent to the, the sovereignty. And it's not. I'd, I'm so disappointed Brexit's been uh, perceived by some of the unionist community as undermining their tradition, their sovereignty. That's certainly not what it's about with the Green Party. We have bona fides there, Christopher. But I look forward to meeting at some stage. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Vincent. And I think Rory wants to come in there as well. And now, just to be clear, uh, Vincent was using an analogy there, and he's by no means uh, on behalf of the government proposing that we change the Sabbath to a Thursday. <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> Well, I think that would have been a, uh, what was it, a, a very um, here a, a very interesting uh, amendment to put. Um, look, in, in turn, um, look here yeah, in relation to what Christopher said, the, a deal was done by a British government. Um, like, if they're going to undermine that deal, they have a right to do that, or they can do that. But I imagine that will create in terrible. Uh, 
intended and unintended consequences, particularly in Ireland. It will create difficulties as regards themselves from uh, credibility and in fairness the Chair uh, and a number of other people spoke about the difficulties we're dealing with, whether it's CPC, um, whether it's CPC certification for hauliers, you know, that may have done the test in the north and might have to switch to the south, and all these other issues. Um, but look, I, and the British government will do whatever suits it to do, and I would say historically it has oftentimes thrown both nationalists and unionists on their bus, and I imagine it will continue to do so. Um, but, but also, in, in fairness, from a British government's point of view, in relation to it, it needs a deal, like uh, at the end of the day, uh, and forgive me if I'm wrong on the percentages, but my understanding is the exports from Britain are in around 43 to 45%. Of, of its exports go to the European Union, so like the the impact on on the economy in Britain and the impact on on the North of of not having at least the mitigations of uh, the withdrawal agreement or a, a better case a, a free trade agreement are, are going to be absolutely huge. Okay, thanks, Rory. Um, I presume we still have a few minutes left here and. Yeah, uh, we'll throw it back over to you again, guys. Thank you very much. We have two members that are actually on the Starleaf that probably you can see that maybe we wouldn't have just as quick access to. We have Emma Sheeran there. Emma, do you have a question? No, I don't have a question as such. Um, thank you all for, for presenting to us uh, this afternoon. I'm a Sinn Féin MLA in, in Mid Ulster. Uh, I think, and this has been probably one of the most frustrating things um, around the whole debate since we had the, the referendum on EU membership. Christopher touched on there, you know, that the that this is maybe being manipulated or that, you know, certain people that want to change the constitutional position of the North are using Brexit or in some way framing the debate um, to, to uh, rear up old tensions or, or something like that. But the reality is for people, I get constituents, I had a constituent on the phone to me yesterday about an issue uh, with importing sheep from, from the UK to the North, who could not give a fiddlers about whether he is in Northern Ireland or a United Ireland or the UK or whatever. But Brexit is causing an issue for his business and it's going to cost him money. And that's what he cares about. So. You know, we can act as if Brexit is is something that has absolutely no implications and could have happened so seamlessly and was never going to, to bring these matters to the fore, but that is, is not the fact. We're changing the constitutional position of the North by virtue of the fact that we're leaving the EU. And therefore, there are issues arising out of that that have to be sorted out. And a clear solution to all of that is re-entering the EU via Irish Unity. That has already been spelled out by the EU. We already have that um, We already have that, that premise existing that the North would slide back into the EU. So of course people are going to look to that as a solution because of the problems that are, are raising out of Brexit and the fact that we've had the best part of four years now and we don't have a deal and the clock is ticking and we still don't know how these things are going to be worked out. So it's, it's a natural follow on that we're, we're going to have these conversations because there are issues now that we don't have answers to. Okay. Joe, do you want to open that up for some comments? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, yeah, we, we could, uh, Neil, uh, you, you, we'll, we'll bring in a second, but just, Emma, um, it's good to hear the, the, the Mid-Ulster accent in, in fine fettle there as well. And you're, you're right, like a lot of our farming community in Donegal, they're, they're networking and you know collaborating with farmers in the north and dealing with meat factories and all that. And I look, I just agree agree with everything you're saying there in terms of the um, you know the bread and butter uh, issues, whether it's farming exports and with the issue with you know beef at the moment as well. So look, there's there's going to be no shortage. And, and I suppose we have a duty and a responsibility as legislators to represent and be the voice for uh, these groups and these individuals that that need their issues addressed. So, Neil, do you want to come back in there again? Yeah, just very briefly, Emma, thanks uh, so much for your comments. And it, it reflects a lot of the testimony that was made uh, in front of the Shannon Brexit Committee by the likes of the UFU and the Irish Farmers Association, the ICMSA and others. And the fact that we are now nearly into December and we don't have a deal 
on the future relationship is absolutely um, terrible. And if we do, are in a situation in a week or so where there is no deal, uh, it will be, to quote Boris Johnson, an absolute failure in statecraft. The fact that the British government didn't take the opportunity to extend uh, the transition period back in July for a year or two, I think is a massive error. And I think it's something that it was really disappointing to see the lack of people, particularly in Great Britain, calling for that at the time. And um, because setting aside a pandemic, trying to agree uh, a whole future relationship with a former partner of the European Union in an 11th month period is beyond ambitious. It's extremely difficult. I suppose for those of us on this island, um, the terms of the protocol regardless of the sovereignty of the House of Commons over the House of Lords and the rulings of 1911, they're all weather, they're binding. No, they're the not. British government has very clear responsibilities to that withdrawal no. agreement. And I think it's very clear for those who are trading on this island, north-south, going forward, that they know exactly what the situation will be and it will, will remain on the 1st of January as it will on the 31st of December. Thanks, Neil. Rory, you want to come back in there? Look, in, in, in fairness, look, Emma said it all, it was the, the point maybe I was going to reiterate myself. Look, the fact is the genie is, is out of the bottle in relation to the whole question of Irish unity. It's Brexit that put it there. That's why I said earlier here, it's, this is incredibly destabilising, the whole move towards Brexit from a unionist point of view, never mind anything else. Look, we, but at this point in time, we are all focused as much as is possible that there would be a deal, that we do have the mitigations. <laughs> And that means that we, the internal market bill, doesn't isn't used as an instrument to undermine the withdrawal agreement and uh, and the Irish protocol, which is is absolutely uh, necessary. And, and any anomalies that may exist or are created can can all be dealt with. You, you, you know, you know what I mean. If if we have good faith across the board, and, and like I said earlier, look that. At the end of the day, you sign up to a deal on an international basis. It does not leave you with a lot of credibility if you do not follow through on that. It's, it's as simple as that. Look, um, and for best case scenario, we have a deal, we have the mitigations. None of this is great from my point of view, you know what I mean? But if we have a worst case scenario, well, that changes everything. That's a gear change. And at the end of the day, a significant amount of people who never considered Irish unity are obviously um, considering it. That. And that's, that's north and south. Um, that, that, that's a huge amount of people within the nationalist community. And it's probably, it's, it's an element there, I can't quantify it within the unionist community that is not particularly happy that they're being taken out of the European Union and the protection and the business opportunities and all that are provided for. Shanae. Thanks, Rory. Colin, back to you guys again. Okay, the final member that we have on board the meeting is George Robinson. George, do you have any question you want to ask? <clears throat> Chair, not very much, but um, I just welcome the, the team. And um, one question to, to Joe and his team. From my point of view, um, a health worker who lives across the border and uh, works here in Northern Ireland, they, they've asked me would, would be advisable to get a, um, an Irish passport. They have got a British passport. They, they want to know would be advisable now to get an Irish passport as well. <clears throat> may not be a very pressing issue, but it's one that, that I've been asked. Maybe Joe would uh, give me a wee steer on it. Well, so what's it? Is it somebody from the Republic who's looking, or somebody from some, uh, sorry, the North working some, in the Republic? Just give me the details there, George. Somebody from the, the North who are yeah. living across the border but working, say, in Ockley Galvin, a health yeah. worker. They wanted to know would it, would, it, would it be advisable for them to get my passport uh, after well, the 1st of January? Yeah, well, it's over. Yeah, I mean, that, that person would be totally entitled to apply for a passport. But I mean, I remember when I was in the Department of Foreign Affairs in 2017, that the surge of people, be it in Scotland or even Wales or England, that, that with grandparent connections to um, the island of Ireland, they were, make, you know, they, they were applying. But I think a lot of it was out of out of fear of the unknown back then. But look, if I suppose the, the entitlements there, George, and I suppose it would be that person's choice to do it or, or not. Right. Thanks very much. Thanks for your presentation as well. Okay. Well, you're, you're, you're very welcome, George. And um, I, I just am reminded of your, your former colleague, uh, Wally Hay. I think Wally's in the House of Lords now. And Wally would have That's been right. born 
six miles uh, from where I live uh, in just a place called Port Lena outside Kilmacrenan. And um, uh, Wally was precluded from applying for a British passport by the mere fact that he was born in Donegal. But we always we always reminded him of that, and it was a, a, a we, had, we had good banter over it. Yes, I believe it. Thanks very much. You're welcome, George. Okay, thank you, George. And, and I, I am sure, Joe, that there's many as a DUP member that has an Irish passport and that, that there are uh, plenty of them. <laughs> oh, and I recently, no, chair, joy chair, I wouldn't know that, but I was recently issued with a non-EU one, which was a delight. Wait, which one? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, look, Joe, that's also finished this side to you and, and the committee. If I could take the opportunity to thank you uh, for, for making yourselves available to join us today. I think we all share uh, a concern about th the future and, and where we're going and whether there will be a deal or no deal. And I think we know uh, the outcome that we would all uh, wish to see in the coming probably days. Um, we've discussed here, uh, as would be uh, from our constituents and wider around, that there are issues of democracy, there are issues of trade, there are social and cultural issues um, that these permeate down into people's lives day and daily uh, and it really is important that we articulate those concerns and issues and we try our best where possible to have those um, addressed. I think that as we move through this transition period and as we move beyond um, into any post-transition scenario, I think the connections between uh, our, our committees uh, and also between those committees that are operating in similar ways in Cardiff and Edinburgh and in London. I think that um, a certain amount of connectivity between ourselves is important so that we can share what the issues are, but also, as is always hoped, that we can discuss solutions together and influence within all of our political parties uh, a need for a solution that delivers for people on the ground. That is, after all, why, why all of us are involved in politics and it is uh, what we should all be aspiring for. So I hope that we can have um, future conversations. I sincerely hope that we will see uh, you the next time, Joe, and not your table. I know that that will be uh, something that we can look forward to. Uh, you maybe have just given us a bit of a dry run today on that. But thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to this meeting again and talking again in the future. Thank you. Well, Colin, th thank you, and, and apologies once again for not alone keeping you in the dark, but also delaying the meeting as well. But look, uh, I, I, I really value um, these type of informal informal meetings as well. We have our, as you pointed out, we have our uh, infrastructure around North South Ministerial Council and then the East West through the British Irish Council and formal and very, very important. But I think we can add value uh, by keeping the conversation going uh, at this level. So, uh, and uh, apology, apologies also for a number of our members due to other committee meetings being on just didn't work out today and apologies from Senator Michael McDowell and Dara Cleary from Fianna Fáil as well so they, they pass on their apologies and Brendan Howland was tied up as well so we have quite a, a degree of experience in this committee uh, we work quite well um, uh, even the Sinn, Sinn Féin guys there isn't that right Rory yourself and John um, we're all we're all in one uh, hem sheet in terms of uh, trying to find solutions for uh, many of the problem that will 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 present itself. So look, thanks once again, Colin, and, and to your members, and thanks to my own Thank members for joining us today. And I'll, I'll just leave you with uh, one uh, snippet from a meeting in Stormont a number of years ago when a group of twelve TDs uh, from uh, Dublin made their made their way up the road to Stormont. A lot of them who had never been there before. We were. Um, looked after by Peter Robinson and the late Martin McGuinness and I remember Peter Peter Robinson starting his introduction uh, by saying this is about building relationships and then he then he just said scrap that and he started again he says he said the relationships are are, are already built it's about what we do with them so I think I think we have uh, a job to do in terms of how we represent all our constituencies uh, but I'm a believer in the only way in doing that is keeping the conversation lines open and we're really, really grateful for you and your team and your official officials in the north and I'd like to thank my own officials for organising this today and hopefully this is uh, the start of, uh, of future uh, productive sessions as well. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you and goodbye. Slam. 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 Bye bye.
we just give a moment to that's us right down to the important George and the important Emma joining us then. So, um, okay, members, if you bear with me just for the next element, it just needs to be read into the record. So, uh, item five is the Brexit issues, the oral evidence session with the Joint Committee on the Implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, due to essential or this business, uh, members of the Joint Committee on the Implementation of the Good Friday Agreement are unable to attend today's meeting. So uh, I'm going to make a suggestion that we reschedule that for early in the new year, uh, yes. maybe when the impact of the internal market legislation and the, uh, and the Brexit deal or no deal scenario is a bit clearer, uh, and that we continue with that connection ongoing. Would members be agreeable to that? Yep, yep. yep. Okay. Um, I had a little note to say there was just still a few minutes. It's just checked. If they are, we can no, just we can, we can take our ease for a few minutes while we wait. We had asked the junior ministers to come forward, so... They're both here. Okay. Oh, okay. Even better. We can move seamlessly into the next item on the agenda. Um, so, item six is Brexit issues, the oral evidence session with the junior ministers. Uh, refer members to those that got to page 457 through to page 551 of the I meeting pack uh, for the relevant papers <laughs> or on page 6 to 62 of the table pack. Um, Members, the monthly briefing, uh, written briefing from the Executive Office is at page 6 on the table pack and it covers the period up to the 6th of November. Uh, the junior ministers will provide us on uh, updates from that. The JMC EU uh, communique from the 29th of October and a report on the Executive's contribution can be found on page 15 of the table papers and a copy of the Welsh Government's action plan for the end of the EU transition period is page 19 of the table papers. If I can take this opportunity to welcome the junior ministers Gordon Lands and Declan Kearney uh, through the usual almost arrest of saying that you are being recorded and everything you say will be written down and can be used in the future uh, by Hansard. And maybe if we pass over to yourselves, junior ministers, to give us uh, an update and then we'll open to questions. So I think we'll start with yourself. Thank, thank you, Colin. And, uh Thanks to the members for having us this afternoon. So I'll begin, uh, Colin, and then uh, Gordon will provide the re remainder of the report. Uh, as usual, we welcome the opportunity to provide you with an update on EU exit matters. But at the outset, uh, Chair, I do want uh, to offer apologies that the committee is getting little or no advance notice of EU exit-related meetings. As we've explained before, that's largely uh, due to the fact that they tend to be arranged, and increasingly so, at very short notice. Uh, I also understand that the committee has received the written update late, and for that I again offer my apologies. Uh, this is an issue that we have raised with officials uh, following our last appearance, and we also raised with officials before we came in here, uh, as late as Monday, uh, when we had a meeting with them. To establish whether your cells were adequately Not safe. In protest or to call in. <laughs> whether whether that's okay. Whether whether your cells had been uh, given sufficient foresight of uh, uh, our our abilities. So I have asked officials to look into this, and to make strenuous efforts to ensure that this does not become a regular occurrence. So there's little doubt that work in relation to EU exit is intensifying and that's going to continue to the, be the case over the coming weeks. Our key objective going forward is to ensure that in legislative and operational terms we are on a firm foundation, not only on the 1st of July, January 2021, but in the following months and years. I would like to take this opportunity to highlight some key happenings over the last few weeks and to provide you with a, a high-level view uh, of what we are expecting to see in the coming weeks. Over recent weeks, future relationship negotiations have intensified, with discussions now taking place daily. We understand that whilst significant progress has been made, key areas of divergence remain across fisheries, <coughs> playing field, including state aid and subsidies, and governance issues. It had been indicated by the EU that for a future relationship agreement to be in place at the end of the transition period, a positive outcome 
from the negotiations was needed by mid-November to allow the EU to complete its internal processes. It now appears that both sides are willing to continue the process and perhaps into early December. And this may complicate the ratification process for any deal that may be secured. In any case, it undoubtedly prolongs the uncertainty and limits the scope for preparation. In all our engagement on the negotiations, we have continuously stressed that every effort should be made to reach a future relationship agreement with the EU which takes account of the interdependencies and interactions with the protocol and also reflects the social, economic and environmental interests of our citizens and businesses here. The extended timetable may have the effect of delaying further decisions by the Joint Committee on the outstanding issues in the protocol, as these are now affected by the work on the main negotiations, and in some cases they are closely interrelated. For example, the issue of the definition of at-risk goods would be much less of an issue if we had a zero tariff, zero quota free trade deal. Since our last appearance at this committee, uh, Gordon and I accompanied the two Joint First Ministers to a meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee on the 29th of October. Discussions focused on the future relationship negotiations and operational readiness, including the protocol and the internal market bill. At the meeting, we emphasised the need to take into account the interdependencies between the negotiations and the implementation of the Irish Protocol, and highlighted our concerns about the limited time available left to conclude an agreement with the EU if it is in fact to be in place before the end of this transition period. We also stress the importance of taking into account the impact at a regional level of any agreement and in particular the need to ensure that any agreement did not have a negative impact here. We also took the opportunity to emphasise the critical and urgent need for businesses to have clarity on the remaining elements of the protocol implementation so that they can prepare for the end of the transition period, including the need for the EU to take a pragmatic approach to implementation of the protocol, given the negative effect, the lack of clarity and guidance on the ability of our businesses and citizens to prepare for the end of the transition period. We provided an update on the points of entry project, emphasising that the executive still needed clarity on outstanding issues to ensure that the project was ready by the 1st of January. In relation to the internal market bill, we highlighted that the executive is agreed on the need for unfettered access for our goods moving west to east. In addition, the Deputy First Minister noted Sinn Féin's concerns in relation to the clauses that could undermine the resilience of the Good Friday Agreement and the need to implement the protocol in full. Regular engagement with the EU also continued through the Joint and Specialised Committees. The last Joint Committee meeting took place on the 19th of October with the next one likely to be scheduled quite soon. Both sides recognise the importance of flexibility in approach, and since time is pressing, that work needs to be accelerated on the decision needed by the committee in relation to implementation of the protocol. On the 5th of November uh, 2020, a meeting of the specialised committee took place, and that was attended by Andrew McCormick, DG of International Relations, and Lindsay Moore, Director of the Executive's Office in Brussels. The report received is that this meeting was constructive and pragmatic in tone, and that the EU and the British Government recorded progress towards agreeing approaches on VAT, on transit, medicines and the single electricity market. There was also discussion of the implementation of SPS checks on agri-food products arriving here from Britain. Ongoing technical sessions are being used to inform further discussion in those areas. I would hope that given all sides are agreed on the importance of arriving at an agreement going forward, that we would be in a position to report on an agreed approach to these important matters at our next here, uh, appearance before your committee. We continue to attend meetings of the Business Engagement Forum, and this continues to provide the Executive 
with opportunities to engage directly with our stakeholders and hear their concerns on key issues which are impacting on the business community here in the North. Recent meetings have covered issues including the application of VAT on goods, moved under the protocol on fettered access and preparing the retail sector for the end of the transition period. Work continues on common frameworks. The British Government revised common frameworks analysis published in September identifies 40 frameworks in which we would have a related interest. Following further assessment, five of these frameworks no longer need any formal agreement for the policy areas to function. Of the remaining 35 frameworks, 32 common frameworks completed their review and assessment phase between mid-October and mid-November, and these are now ready for ministerial approval and to progress to provisional agreement by the JMC. That leaves three frameworks which have presented difficulties in the review and assessment space due to the level of completeness, and they are the mutual recognition of professional qualification, uh, services and organics, and officials are putting the necessary contingencies in place for the end of the transition period should formal agreement on framework outline agreements and draft concordats not be arrived at. Work continues on the four common frameworks identified as fully implementable by the 31st of December 2020, and these are emissions and trading scheme, hazardous substances planning, food and feed safety and hygiene, and finally nutritional labelling and composition standards on which the Health Committee has already commenced scrutiny. And finally, before I hand over to Gordon, can I also confirm that we are monitoring the potential for the Internal Market Bill to impact on citizens' rights, and as you're aware, on the 14th of October, the Human Rights Commission and the Equality Commission uh, here, alongside the Irish Equality Human Rights Commission, indicated that they had written to the British Secretary of State seeking assurance that the Internal Market Bill would have no adverse effect on the no diminution commitment within the protocol, and we're keeping a watching brief on that issue as well. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. It's always good to be here uh, with the committee and to be able to provide an update. Uh, I'm going to focus today uh, on operational readiness for the end of transition period, which I think was a key concern of many members during um, our last meeting. And whilst the executive is fully supportive of the need to ensure that every effort is made to reach an agreement, uh, we recognise that these talks could still result in a non-negotiated outcome and we understand the need for continued focus on operational readiness. So to ensure uh, we prepare on a collaborative basis, there is significant daily engagement between officials um, in the executive and in HMG. Uh, as part of that, senior officials continue to engage on a fortnightly basis with the UK um, government through attendance at the uh, Transition Period Readiness Portfolio Board. <coughs> Uh, at ministerial level, executive ministers take part uh, in the government's uh, exit operations committee meetings, uh, as well as quadrilateral meetings with the Paymaster General and the other devolved administrations, which consider operational readiness issues. Engagement across Northern Ireland departments has highlighted 12 day one readiness issues, each of varying impact that need to be considered uh, going forward. In addition to these day one issues, the executive has also identified other key areas where solutions and contingencies will need to be developed and in place post-transition. Now, given the short timescale until the end of the transition period, the executive's focus will be on six high priority impact risks with the departments, uh, managing the risks and mitigations associated with the other risk areas, escalating to the executive as necessary. Unsurprisingly, Given coverage in the press, the six key areas are food supply, flow of regulated and priority goods such as chemicals and medicines, business preparedness, data flow, uh, facilities for SPS checks and transport. The most significant challenge for our operational readiness planning is the lack of clarity around the implementation of the protocol and its interaction with the outcome of the negotiations. And we want to continue to highlight the impacts of this uncertainty, both at official and ministerial level, and to remind them 
of the commitment uh, that the application of the protocol should impact as little as possible on the everyday life of communities uh, in both <coughs> Ireland and Northern Ireland. There are a number of issues which compound the impact on our food supply, including the listing of the UK as a third country, uh, arrangements for supermarkets and export health certificates. However, the mitigations for these issues are out with the direct control of the executive and work continues to ensure uh, equivalent and equally effective mitigations are in place for the end of the transmission, transition period. A secure and reliable food supply like medicines is of vital importance and that's why the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have written directly um, to the European Commission Vice President uh, Maros Sefcovic in relation to the SPS control impact uh, on our food supply and we of course will continue to raise our concerns with uh, our government and the EU as discussions continue on these issues. Mitigations are also being developed in relation to the other five uh, high-impact uh, issues. Our officials are also liaising with the government to ensure our requirements are taken into account in their contingency plans for the movement of critical goods such as medicines from EU to GB. And our officials are working cross-departmentally to put in place arrangements to ensure the continuity of supply of such goods across the Irish Sea. Plans are in place to provide further guidance to and engage with businesses on the steps that they should now take. However, this guidance and engagement can only cover the arrangements that are currently known. We recognise and fully understand the frustration that is expressed by businesses regarding areas that remain uncertain. Further guidance to businesses will need to be prepared and issued when these issues are resolved. The Trader Support Service is now in place but it will be important that this service has been tried and tested before the end of the transition period to ensure its reliability and business confidence. There is an increasingly high risk that there will not be a data adequacy agreement in place by the end of the transition period, and mitigations for the impact of this continues to be raised by our officials at various levels in the government. DERA is progressing the work on the facilities at the points of entry and temporary facilities will be in place for the 1st of January 2021 and the necessary staff and IT systems are coming into place. Work is also progressing on the permanent facilities that will be required. Now, some of the transport issues may be resolved if there is a transport agreement as part of a, as part of a wide ranging agreement on the future relationship. However, if that does not transpire, alternative arrangements, including potential bilateral agreements, will, need, will be needed to secure our essential interests. In addition to these activities on operational uh, activities, work continues across the whole of the civil service in Northern Ireland and the Assembly to ensure that all the necessary legislation is in place for the 31st of December. Work is ongoing to ensure that the Northern Ireland components of nine Westminster bills are in place. In addition, uh, 30 Westminster SIs have still to be made and a, for a further 47 SRs are to be brought before the Assembly. Uh, there's no doubt that there's a significant amount of work to be done in the next few weeks, but with continued commitment uh, and careful planning, there's little doubt that this key piece of work will be delivered. That's helpful to the committee, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think you've written the timetable for most of the MLAs for the next three weeks or four weeks uh, in uh, getting busy to deal with the issues of there. And thank you very much for the uh, update uh, and the information that's contained in it. Um, we met just before you come in with the Joint uh, Arachnus Committee on EU Affairs. And um, one of the points that I had raised with them was obviously the media reports this morning that President-elect Biden had committed to uh, his administration's perspective that there should be no borders on the island of Ireland. And what I was wondering was, and, and I want to try and take a step back from this to try and depoliticise it, that it doesn't turn into uh, a ping pong issue. Really? Regardless of whether, just feel really? re regardless of whether you are 
see the priority as east, west or north, south in terms of trade or, or where your particular political home is. The internal market bill to those outside of the process appears to have caused serious problems and concerns. Can you give us an assessment of the impact that that has had on the negotiations that you are involved in? Yes. Uh, the executive doesn't have an agreed position on the internal market bill. Uh, and I think we've explained that in the past to the, the committee. Uh, I and my own party have very serious reservations. I think that it has uh, far-reaching implications for Strand 1, 2 and 3 of the Good Friday Agreement. Our colleagues in Wales and Scotland have been very forthright in JMC meetings in setting out their view that it's a full frontal assault on the devolved arrangements for Wales and Scotland. Uh, and, and it has caused something of a furore, even within the, the British Parliament itself. The, 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 the uh, House of Lords Constitutional Committee came out with a very, very serious critique of the Internal Market Bill. Now, that's in, in our setting. The reality is, I think, as everyone in this room would accept, while we have a division of opinion in relation to what the Internal Market Bill means in the here and the now and going forward, the executive is united in relation to the needs to ensure that uh, the rights and the business interests of our society here are best protected, regardless to the, the issue of the internal market bill, and that there is frictionless trade and commercial activity uh, east to west. In terms of the, uh, the negotiations themselves, it, it, uh, it is clear that it has had a very unsettling effect on the uh, the European Commission negotiating team, uh, Maris Sevakovic and Michel Barnier in previous meetings have been quite emphatic about that. Of course, th that has been, uh, I suppose, uh, aided and sharpened by the fact that representatives of the British government themselves acknowledged that it did represent a breach of international law. So it has had that repercussion, and I think that the internal market bill has created negative acoustics in relation to the, the negotiations. But the indications that we are receiving are that both sides are attempting at this time to take a very pragmatic approach towards moving through those kind of negative acoustics and the potential difficulties, the practical difficulties that, and legislative difficulties that, they may pose, that it may pose in the future. Uh, so to that extent, I think it's impossible to give you uh, a confirmed view of whether it is now throwing up a barricade or a barrier. Uh, my sense is, and it's only my sense, and based upon recent updates from officials, that uh, it's not going to create an intractable difficulty, even though it has had a very negative influence on things. If I can finish on this last point, just with reference to President-elect uh, Biden uh, and uh, that administration coming into uh, to power in the States in January. I, I think that the remarks made by himself uh, mo and his most recent comments, uh, alongside comments from the Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, uh, the Chair of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, Richie Neal, have been very important in, relation, in geopolitical terms. And, and I think incentivising this particular British government and the negotiation team to try and find a way through the difficulties in the, the negotiations at this time. So I think that his comments should be welcomed in the sense that uh, if the United States, the new United States administration, is making very clear assertions about the importance of uh, the agreement here, our peace settlement being protected, that the island economy is protected, that, uh, that the issues at the core of this negotiation around uh, a future relationship between Britain and the EU are resolved. I think that that's a helpful influence in wider geopolitical terms because uh, I would hope it would act as an encouragement to the, the British side to recognise that uh, in order to maintain that special relationship between Britain and the US, it's in everybody's interest to see the best deal struck possible between Britain and the EU in terms of its future relationship. Well, you're certainly um, 
uh, very optimistic uh, in thinking that you can um, step back from the politics and then throw the internal market bill uh, into the mix, one of the most um, politically divisive pieces um, of legislation for, for some, um, because of course there is a divergence of opinion and there's a divergence of opinion within the executive office uh, on this particular bill. Declan set out where his um, party is. We've talked about this before. Um, we take a different approach to it um, because we recognise that it's a good step towards recognising Northern Ireland's place within the United Kingdom. Um, in fact, the, uh, the, the relevant section of the Internal Market Bill um, says that there should be a need for the government to maintain Northern Ireland's place in the UK, respect Northern Ireland's place as part of the customs territory of the UK, and recognise the need to facilitate free flow of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That's something that we should all be in favour of, because that's good for everybody uh, in Northern Ireland. That's just um, not an issue for unionists, uh, but it's good for all of us uh, altogether. Look, I, I can't speak on how it's affecting the negotiations. Uh, I'm not in there. Declan's already set out how um, there have been concerns that have been raised um, by some within the Joint Committee. We have certainly uh, expressed how we welcome um, the certainty that may be able to bring for, for businesses here in Northern Ireland who are concerned uh, about the protocol. But we are united um, as an executive uh, and I hope as an assembly on wanting to make sure that we get the best deal uh, for people in Northern Ireland. This should not be pitted uh, one against the other. Is it east-west uh, versus north-south? Uh, I think that would be wrong because what I want to see happen uh, is that free flow um, between east and west and north and south because I believe that's good for Northern Ireland and it's good uh, for all of our people. Unfortunately, some people have approached um, the Brexit debate, first of all, by trying um, to prevent um, Brexit from, from taking place. And Northern Ireland has been used as a pawn uh, in all of this. And I'm very disappointed that that has been the case. What I want to see happen is flexibility shown towards uh, Northern Ireland. There's no reason why that flexibility and that goodwill can't be shown, because it has a huge impact on us here. Uh, if this um, protocol is implemented in the way in which some people want to see it implemented, it's going to have a huge detrimental impact uh, on Northern Ireland. Uh, I note um, Joe Biden's comments uh, as well. I think, I think he said that he didn't want to see guards uh, at the border between um, Northern Ireland and the Republic. That was never going to be the case, and that's not something I think anybody uh, around this room uh, wants to, to see uh, in any way. Um, so the President-elect can, can rest assured that is not something um, that is going to be happening. That's not going to be, be popping up. But the real um, threat, I think, to our peace and, and to our um, uh, prosperity um, is the, uh, the, the danger of those ad additional barriers between uh, East and, and West. That's not something that I uh, want to see uh, moving forward. And I think it changes the constitutional position uh, of Northern Ireland, which goes against um, the, the Belfast Agreement uh, as well. So what we need to do, um, what we're working towards, uh, is making sure that we can have that free, uh, frictionless movement, free flow of goods, North, South and East, West. Well, I'm sure when your assurances are relayed to President-elect Biden, he will take comfort in I'm sure he'll hear about them very soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, I, I was being very careful in that question to say, regardless of your perspective on the internal market bill, it was to find out from yourselves an assessment of the impact that it was having. So I do appreciate hearing, I suppose, essentially both sides or two sides uh, um, to that. And I think it's important to try and gauge just the impact that, that it has had. Um, if I could ask... The Welsh Government, as I understand it, have uh, recently published an action plan which is based for the end of the EU transition period. Is it the intention of the Executive to do something similar, to produce some sort of roadmap for what will happen after the 1st of January that can be detailed to businesses, to communities, to groups, to sort of you know, detail and explain what will happen next? Well, whether or not that's going to be in one single codified document uh, or not is not something I can give you uh, an assurance on uh, today, but it absolutely is the case um, that we, because of the impact of the protocol and because of our circumstances here, um, we have um, a lot more uh, concerns uh, around the whole process um, as, it, as it carries on at the minute. So there's been extensive work done, um, Mr Chairman, around all of these issues uh, to make sure that there is as much certainty as we can give 
uh, to businesses and how we actually plan and prepare for the future as well. Of course, so much of this is going to be dependent uh, upon what the protocol looks like, and so much of the protocol is going to be dependent upon what an agreement uh, looks like uh, as well. But certainly, I think we've had excellent engagement um, with businesses and other groups here in Northern Ireland throughout this process. We want to continue that, and anything that we can give to help or assist as we move forward is something that we would look upon very favourably. And how, how has the Welsh Government been able to do that at this stage? Have, have you, are you aware of that document? Or, um, it's not a trick question. Have you seen that action plan from them, or have they mentioned it? Or I, I haven't. I haven't read it all. I will be honest. I'm. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I haven't. I haven't seen all of that. But I think the. the, the there's that fundamental <coughs> difference isn't there, between what's happening in Wales and what's happening here. Is that there's additional uncertainty because of the of the protocol that we have to implement here. So to add briefly, Colin, to what Gordon has just said. Uh, we, 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 we now have a, a fully operational interdepartmental working group. Uh, we touched on that before, but that has been stood up and the comments that we shared with you before about the, the hub CCG, uh, its responsibility for COVID uh, and the forward look towards Brexit allows for uh, the interdepartmental working group to coexist alongside the, uh, the CCG, uh, C3. Uh, so that allows for, where required, a coordinated approach, a joined up approach to be taken towards COVID recovery and also then overlapping issues that may arise in relation to Brexit. What, what, we, ha what we are now receiving regular uh, reports on it is a heat map, uh, which uh, essentially horizon scans the, the immediate issues, the, 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 the pinch points, uh, and then how they de-escalate as matters of priority. And the executive is now also receiving uh, a countdown action plan that uh, enumerates the, uh, the various issues, the actions, uh, responsibility for taking that action forward in terms of completion dates. So it tasks and it, uh, and it completes. And that sets out, I think, uh, a, a clear framework within which now uh, the the operational uh, readiness issues are being uh, are being considered and then previewed. Okay. Um, look, my final uh, question. Um, we met with uh, councils over the last two weeks or the past number of weeks uh, and have heard from them directly their concerns, particularly in relation to finance and and the. The, the sort of uh, income streams that would have been guaranteed from European funds that are now, um, they're not in jeopardy, but they're certainly the, the source of the, that funding is going to be questioned and how it will come through. Um, as I understand that the UK government said that it's going to use the financial assistance powers within the internal market bill to implement that shared prosperity fund. Now, you know, if that is, have you any understanding of how that shared prosperity fund is going to work? Has there been any headline considerations? So will it go under the Barnet consequentials? Will it be delivered as we're going to tell you what money's for and then you deliver it? Or we will give you money and you can determine what it's for? Has there been any conversations around that and, and those, that shared funding and how it will make its way down uh, onto the ground? No, not between the executive office, um, but there is there have been ongoing conversations between finance and the finance minister has met on a, a number of occasions, and we're told that he's in regular contact with ministers in the treasury, seeking clarification and detail on the proposed fund, and obviously pressing the case for for maximising uh, the fund here uh, locally. Um, there have also been um, collaboration with Scottish and Welsh ministers in relation uh, to that as well. It's expected that a lot of these decisions will take place following the spending review, um, so we hope to get more detail uh, on that in the coming days. Okay, well that's one certainly that we would be uh, keen along with Finance Committee to, to keep an eye on because we have had um, also the special EU body uh, group here last week and I mean looking at the level of and, and the amount of money that they have at their disposal within broad headlines but then they can um, examine the groups and examine the projects and see which um, they can direct their funding to um, you know, we would just be conscious that if that suddenly is money that's handed you and told you'll spend it on X, Y and Z and there's little flexibility in there 
um, that could create difficulties going forward. So um, let's hope that, that there is that flexibility for us. I'm going to pass the Deputy Chair to Doug. Thanks, um, Chair. Declan Gordon, thank you for, for that. I mean, for me, that's, that was, that's one of the best briefings I've had so far, actually, and, and really did clarify an awful lot of issues and, and, and raise issues. I guess listening to you, is, I, I really get the sense that we are so low down. It's really hard for us to influence what's happening in regards to uh, the agreement and, and, and the protocol, but like a roller coaster. You know, it's going down a particular direction, you're holding on, and we just don't know where it's going to stop. Um, and, and I'm really concerned about that. And we have mentioned them before about planning and how do we plan um, without knowing all of this. And I know, Declan, you mentioned planning, but, but I'm concerned about the Executive Office planning um, for a non agreed outcome or an agreed outcome, what the modelling is, uh, what's the best case scenario, what's the worst case um, scenario. Uh, I'm, I'm particular this, if I get into the weeds a little bit. Uh, if there's an agreement which means that there will be export health certificates for foodstuffs to come to Northern Ireland, and there therefore is a reduction of that foodstuffs coming in, creating a deficit of foodstuffs, and therefore we have inflation of foodstuffs, which then affects our lowest paid, are we talking to the Department of Finance, Department of Communities, um, uh, Department of the Economy to try and make sure that we're mitigated against that now. And, and if that plan is being worked up, could we not get sight of what that plan is likely to look at if that is the worst case scenario? So what is the off the shelf plan for worst case? What is the off the shelf plan for, for, for best case? Yeah. Well, where we are, we are engaged. I think first of all, well, First of all, thank you for, for for your words. I'm glad to know we're getting high marks today for uh, for, for for our presentation. It's not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that um, we are we are glad that we can come here and, and, and give, um, give give detail uh, to the to the committee as well. Um, obviously, we want to try and target where the problem is at first. There's always the rule for, for planning in that, that, that's absolutely correct, but it is important that we're, that we're focused on tackling the, the problem rather than the consequences of that problem if it's not, if it's not solved. Uh, and we are engaging with the government and the EU on mitigations um, for issues such as, as food supply uh, and security uh, to our uh, citizens. Um, you said that we're very far down the line. I think that we are punching above uh, our weight. Uh, I think that we have had an impact through um, the Joint Committee in particular, where we have that opportunity to express our concerns, and at a more detailed level through the Specialised Committee uh, as well. Um, there is planning going on for all contingencies. I don't have that in front of you or to give to you today, uh, as, 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 as you wouldn't ex expect. Um, but yes, there are a number of scenarios that are being uh, looked at, uh, exercises that we are taking part in as well to ensure that even in reasonable worst case scenario, we know what it is that, that, that needs to happen. And um, officials are working very, very hard ac across all levels of, of government. And um, those key issues with high impact ha have been identified and contingency plans um, being considered as well. I don't know if Declan has anything more to add to that. Yeah, the, the engagements are taking place uh Doug, on a bilateral basis between the Interdepartmental Working Group on behalf of TEO with all of the departments and the executive, and no department uh, is, uh, is, is content. We're, we're all facing very, very challenging circumstances, so whether that's health, it's infrastructure, whether it's, uh, it's agriculture. Some departments are going to obviously face much greater challenges than others, uh, but nevertheless, it's impacting at, at, at every level. I do think that there's uh, been a significant, a noticeable upswing in engagement between our officials, or at least access for our officials, with other officials who are cited on the progress of uh, the negotiations. That's allowing for this level of clarity about scenario setting uh, to take place. But as Gordon said, uh, there are a series of, uh, of, of, of key issues that uh, need to be satisfactorily resolved. There are a series of priority day one issues that we've mentioned in this briefing already. The focus is very heavily on ensuring that we either have solutions uh, on day one or we have pathways in relation to them. So to, to take an example where we, have, uh, where we would have difficulties at the moment in respect of um, at-risk goods and the definition of that. 
Um, it, it may well be that uh, what will have to happen is for the main deal, for the future relationship agreement, to be bottomed out in order then to create a pathway which would allow for uh, compliance on the food and the meat issues, the meat issue which has, has flared up as a very significant concern yes, yeah. for the executive uh, in the course of the last fortnight. So it, it is a combination of setting out scenarios, getting a focus on them, endeavouring to find solutions, but then uh, horizon scanning scenario setting for what has not been resolved at this point in time and trying to put means and ways in place to deal with those situations. Uh, one, one last thing that's perhaps relevant in terms of what you have asked and going back to some of Colin's earlier questions. Um, <coughs> our, our officials tell us that the British government um, is, is, in, is increasingly um, indicating a level of uh, operational readiness in their assessment. That is with regard to the, the negotiations. But it's without sufficient regard for the issues that our officials have been raising. Now, that's nothing new. We have repeatedly told you that when you're not in the room, then uh, you're significantly handicapped in the extent to which you have influence. So that's why we seem to be getting indications from the British government that they are slightly more optimistic about where all of this may land. Uh, but our officials are saying we're not there yet. So as, as a result, there's a, there's a need for a problem-solving engagement to, to deal with that. Our officials are saying they are talking to others within the British government system who are receptive and understanding of our concerns. Uh, but that is not actually then getting into the room or being prioritised or bottomed out in the negotiation room in relation to finding a solution. So one of the considerations being reserved by our uh, officials is that uh, we may need to escalate those concerns to a very high political level in, in order then to ensure that the issues are taken into the room and that there's an urgent resolution found to them. And that's reflective of the nature of the engagement that the uh, officials are having at the moment. Yeah, thanks. I guess that was the point I was trying to make. That it felt like we were on a roller coaster because we've got that extra layer um, to get through, which is the, the, the protocol, and you can't really hit the protocol till the other piece is done. And that's the kind of the point I was trying to make. And and I'm and I'm and I'm not trying to to, to spread alarm in any shape or form. But you know, it's funny that we were talking in October about you know October's awful late to be getting to a deal here, and you know we're now we're now sitting halfway through November, and and and, and when. We're talking about going in to December, but if I give you the, this analogy, for example, um, and people maybe don't realise this, but if there's a flood in in England and, and a small town is cut off, um, and foodstuffs don't get into it, you you you, you don't see the fact is that the people there are all in the supermarkets or the shops buying up everything on the shelf. You don't you don't get to see that. It's very low low key. But if that was to happen in Northern Ireland. if foodstuff weren't to get in, if ASDA was to withdraw, if Tesco's were to say we can't get food in. You would end up with the very same thing that we're seeing now with COVID, and that is panic buying. And if you've got that panic buying, you're seeing empty shelves. You get a perception that in Northern Ireland there is food shortages, and food shortages, as a perception, can can create civil unrest. So, so I guess, what messaging are we trying to put out there to make sure that people realise is there is not going to be food shortages. You know that the government, in some way or another, if, if there is extra sort of checks being put in for whatever reason, and you know we don't want these checks, but if they are put in there, that the government will make sure that there isn't going to be that sort of. How, how are we getting that message out? I think we're I think we're very focused on yeah. uh, on on those concerns, and regrettably, and this is because you're getting to a potential end point, mm. and because that's an unresolved issue, there are issues for hauliers. There are concerns beginning to be. Uh, expressed around supply chains, access to foods. Uh, our, our large supermarkets are expressing concerns about getting uh, foodstuffs and supplies across the, the Irish Sea. Uh, so it, it, it is clearly recognised as an issue that we need to have resolved, uh, which is why it's been escalated in relation to our approach. In some ways, you're at a point potentially in this negotiation where it, it may well be it is coming to a conclusion. But uh, there are now possibilities escalating for a resolution. So in some ways, you're at the point of greatest advantage and pressure in relation to trying to get 
critical issues resolved at this point in time. And I think that that uh, plays very heavily on the minds of our officials in relation to ensuring that as they engage with their counterparts, that these issues are identified as very significant issues for us, because we're on a different land mass. So <coughs> the, the problems are very significantly magnified. I think the, the, if, if, if implied in your question is the public messaging, what is the public messaging? It is, we all knew that this was a major problem. This is a, a serious challenge for our society. But our executive is absolutely committed and determined to ensure that these kind of concerns that could become very, very uh, febrile in the minds of ordinary people, that they're resolved to everyone's satisfaction with as much reassurance as possible. But we're not there yet. Yeah. Uh, and, and it, will, it will be another question, um, and thank you for that. And, and of course, I'm using foods as an example, but you are talking business, and we are talking about transport, and we are talking about goods. I'm just using food as as, as that example. But, but 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 I guess if I can just come back on that, for, for me as an MLA, to want to go to my constituency and reassure them, I kind of have to see something. I kind of have to see something that's there to say, look, don't worry, if this happens, this is what we're doing. So I kind of need to see that. And if we don't have our constituents reassured, and, and let's all be, let's all face it here, that they haven't been reassured by what we've done on COVID, and I'm not blaming anybody else, just collectively, they haven't been. If they're not reassured on, on COVID, I'm just concerned about them being reassured in regards to, to, to Brexit. So I would like to see, as an, as an MLA for my constituents, is if this happens, this is what we'll do. And for that, we need an off-the-shelf, something that we can tap into if possible. But Elizabeth, thank you. And that wasn't a question for comment, but sure. just, just a general comment from me. Thank you. OK, we'll go to Pat, please. Uh, I, I, I want to go back to the internal market bill. Uh, I know you, you, you touched on it earlier there today. And, I mean, we know it was heavily defeated in the House of Lords, but the British government has said they're going to bring it uh, back in again. Uh, the, the, the Welsh and the Scottish governments have been particularly vocal in their opposition to this bill, and they have said it will undermine their own devolved arrangements in their respective countries. Um, I'm just wondering, could you explain what impact the internal market bill could have on our uh, devolved arrangements here and our sharing executive? And just a, a second quick question. Uh, I see stuff leaked in the English media this morning. Uh, some cabinet papers warning that there could be a systemic economic crisis. And uh, just as a double whammy, what, what impact would that have here if it were to happen? Okay. Okay. Um, well, I, I did. I did manage to to hear a little bit of the previous uh, conversation, and I hear your comments uh, as well about the internal market bill. It seems like uh, Sinn Féin and uh, our friends from the from the south are great advocates now of the House of Lords, and uh, seem to seem to think they're uh, uh, they're all they're all doing a a, a great job. Um, look, I'm not going to rehearse. The DUP ones are. The DUP ones, absolutely. I suppose, I suppose I read it just in, in the context uh, of how divisive this bill actually is. You know, when it was. It wasn't a narrow defeat. It was very heavily defeated in the House of Lords, and uh, I mean, it's not for me to interfere in how the British uh, want to organise their own parliamentary system, but it does highlight the, the divisiveness of this particular bill. But what I'm more concerned about is the impact that it's going to have on us here and on our own particular yeah, institutional like, arrangements. Like, I think well, we've, we've already set out our stalls today and where we stand in relation to the Internal Markets Bill, and we certainly had, had a prolonged conversation about it uh, at, our, at our last committee meeting. We're going to have different perspectives uh, on this. Uh, for me, I see there's protections there for Northern Ireland. I see that it, it strengthens and helps to support the inter internal market of the UK, which I think is important important for our future prosperity. I think it's important um, uh, for the things that we want to see for our own citizens uh, as well. And for me, anything that can protect that and uh, ensure that that continues and ensure that there's a free uh, flow uh, of, of goods um, between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK uh, is, a, is a good thing. In relation to your other question, um, obviously COVID is a, is a huge challenge uh, as well. Um, that's why I want to make sure that when it comes to, to, to Brexit uh, as well, we have that certainty. That's why it's so important that we're all working together 
to ensure that there is a deal, to make sure that that deal is good for Northern Ireland, and to make sure the protocol is implemented in such a way that there aren't damaging uh, impacts uh, for for Northern Ireland. The risks here, um, as a result of the of the protocol as well, what I want to make sure is um, that we get beyond those where that is possible, um, because what should be at the front of our minds is, is our citizens, uh, the people that uh, that we represent. I recognise the challenges that protocol and COVID uh, bring, um, but that's why we need to work together uh, to make sure that we're actually getting the changes that we need uh, to ensure the best outcome for, for our citizens. Look, there's always going to be political differences here as well, uh, and a difficult uh, a, a difference in, in opinion and, po and point of view, um, but that's what we're striving and working towards. And, and you don't foresee any negative outcome in terms of our own uh, political arrangements here, or any sort of negative economic outcome for us? I don't think there needs to be any um, negative political outcomes for us here in Northern Ireland. I recognise that the process of leaving the European Union has been one um, in which there's People have, have taken very strong opinions on either side. Um, though I think of how, if you look at how the executive has approached this over the last number of months, we're united and wanting to make sure that we that we get a good uh, deal. The first and deputy first minister uh, have written together to the to the vice president to express the concerns that we have. I don't think that any of this should stop us uh, from from working together. And all parties um, in the uh, assembly, uh, I think, may disagree with um, how the internal market bill uh, has has come about. But all of us um, should be in agreement with its aims, uh, which is to protect the internal market um, uh, of the UK, because that's necessary for for our prosperity. So we, we, we'll not rehearse the, the earlier conversation or the, or the differences because we all in this room are well enough acquainted with what they were. But when the internal market bill was introduced originally, aside from the assertion that, or admission that it did represent a breach of international law, we were told that it was uh, spawned as an attempt to, have, uh, to create negotiation leverage and that it would only be used if the, if the EU and the European Commission didn't actually cross the line. I don't think, as, uh, as an objective, that that has worked. Um, now we're left with the internal market bill. Um, and I do have concerns in relation to uh, how it could impact on uh, the three strands of the Good Friday Agreement and in different ways. But to take my answer to your question on COVID, I think it's generally uh, accepted that we are going to face, uh, if not a global economic recession, uh, then we are certainly going to see recession in, in certain countries and very, very severe economic difficulties in others. And we are very much in the territory of very serious economic difficulty post-COVID. Uh, and I believe that the Britain is also in that territory uh, as well. So I think that there's, a, there's an economic uh, wind coming at us. This is all the stuff of a perfect storm. But Clause 46 of the Internal Market Bill actually uh, gives primacy to, uh, back to the British government, to the British Secretary of State, in relation to uh, the, the making of spending priorities here in the in the north. So it seems to me there's a potential contradiction there in relation to powers potentially going back to the British government arising from the internal market bill, which may hamper uh, or dilute the ability of the executive to work most effectively. And in the context of even greater economic challenges within our region and on the island and between these two islands, then our executive needs to be liberated and empowered to make decisions make priorities and, and seek to deliver on them, which are in the best interests of our own citizens, rather than an assumption being made out with this place about what's required in the midst of an economic recession. And that would be my fundamental concern in relation to the, the two points that you raise. Martina. Um, thank you, thank you, Declan and, and Gordon for that, and, and it was a very good presentation. I, I have found all of your presentations that you have given us on Brexit very helpful uh, and very informative and useful. 
So uh, I want to thank you uh, for that. And I think despite the fact that the British government is treating the five parties of the executive um, like mushrooms and keeping you in the dark, um, I do agree <coughs> that you are punching above your weight with very little um, information. And maybe, as you said, it, uh, you're not there yet in making an impact on those negotiations and you may have to elevate um, some, some political noise uh, about that. But can I ask you in relation to the um, Ursula von der Leyen today in the EU has said that they're ready and prepared for a no deal because we're only 35 days away. The Irish government we know are ready and prepared. They have spent millions uh, and whatever's going to happen, there's a Brexit omnibus bill going through the Oireachtas. And then we have President-elect Joe Biden's comments today, reassuring comments uh, for some of us uh, with regards to uh, his position on, on Brexit and uh, a future relationship with the British government and the uh, USA. So do you think of all of that combined uh, may in any way have a bearing on a future relationship if the British government is hearing and observing and watching what's going on around them? You know, do you think that that would accelerate? Because there doesn't seem to be an urgency or an emergency going on, and here we are only 35 days away. Well, I, I don't know how um, useful it would be for, for me to comment on what the actions of others um, will have on a, on a third party. Um, I would say that the EU and the Irish government saying and emphasising how prepared they are uh, for a no deal is part of the, the negotiations as well. It's all part of the of the, the play out uh, of those. Um, so it's not for me to say what impacts um, something that one person says will will have on on another. From our point of view, um, I think that we have been involved in getting our views across. Um, in making sure that the concerns that people have here are heard. And I think that, that that's actually got national and international coverage because of some of the interventions that um, the First and Deputy First Minister, for example, have made over the, the last number uh, of weeks. That's what we need to focus on, um, not the tittle-tattle, not the he said, she said that's going out around that, because there's plenty of that going on. Our focus needs to be recognising the serious implications that the protocol can have on Northern Ireland, communicating uh, those concerns both to our own government and to the European Union, which we have done, and making sure that we sh we're emphasising the need um, for us to get those issues addressed, not because of politics, but because uh, of the impact that it's going to have uh, on our citizens. And I think that's why um, we have been effective uh, and why our voice has been heard uh, on these issues. And um, certainly, if um, no matter, no matter what, what, what takes place, um, I know that it won't be because our, our voice haven't, hasn't been heard or our concerns uh, haven't been uh, aired uh, either. So we need to keep our focus on communicating those areas uh, of concern. Yeah, and I think there are a number of moving parts. So I agree with Gordon. I do think that uh, whether it's, t it's the passage of time or we're arriving at a point where uh, this is the, the moment of greatest leverage, uh, but as I said earlier, our, our officials feel that they are having an impact uh, on their counterparts, but that is not getting into the negotiation room as an understood or an internalised priority. But, but that's an improvement from where we were uh, some months ago, when our original hearings and presentations to you would have been much more um, doubtful and unclear than perhaps they are now. We're not. We don't have a result. We can't declare a result. But you can see that the uh, the dynamics have changed. That the parts have been moving. I suppose the second thing is, um, and and this is where I just briefly revisit the the point around the internal market bill is is relevant. No, no system is monolithic. So the the House of Lords isn't monolithic either. That's why. You know, individuals within the House of Lords would, would express concerns or offer a sharp critique of the internal market bill, whilst others obviously would be supportive and, and tolerant of it. But the, some of the initiatives taken uh, by the, uh, the two joint First Ministers have, have also been timed in order to 
uh, try and reach out to those within the European system who appear to be not only influential but most attuned to our, our needs. So we are aware that in respect of, of the latest initiative taken that uh, th that was well received by Maros Sevakovic uh, and his officials. Uh, they understand the issue and therefore they um, have, 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 have told us that they want to be as helpful as possible in that regard. And then to my, my last point, with regard to the wider geopolitical circumstances, no system operates in, in, in isolation from other geopolitical uh, influences and pressures. No system is monolithic and they don't operate in isolation. So to that extent then, I think <coughs> Ursula von der Leyen's comments, which I, I read earlier this morning, they are useful insofar as she's indicating there's the potential for a deal, but we're not there yet. And she actually indicated what the issues were that remained extant. <coughs> and she actually said it's much better to actually have a full member uh, rather than a, a good partner. But intimated that if what you're getting is a good partner, then that's a good situation to have. Therefore, that indicates uh, the potential for a landing zone for a, with, for a, a future relationship arrangement. When you then take into consideration the, the commentary towards the interventions from the US combined, I do think that all of that, it might not be prescriptive, it might not actually have the, the, the desired result that all of us would want, but I don't think that those involved in negotiations are impervious to um, those, kind, that, those kind of comments being made, on, for example, by the President-elect of the States the remarks to be decoded and translated from the President of the European Parliament, and then the efforts that we're making ourselves to try and ensure that uh, we, we are clicking with those moving parts and then trying to influence them in a direction which would give us the preferred result for ourselves. I mean, I, I, I just think, Gordon, that I'm not saying that you're totally regarding everything that's happening as white noise and negotiation because as a former MEP, they're very precise and very legalistic. And in 35 days' time, something is going to happen one way or another. So they would be very prepared, whatever the outcome. And hopefully it is an outcome, it's a future relationship and a deal that, we, that all of us want. But when you talked about operational readiness, uh, Gordon, the thing that uh, struck me when you talked about the six high-risk items that you, you, you named, and one of them, or two of them, chemicals uh, and medicine, and I am wondering if this committee could be in part with the kind of modelling that's going on, because I have no doubt that the uh, civil service are working very hard at what might be coming at us. But for instance, in another committee, like the Department of Infrastructure, I have been asking, look, can we get even an estimate, a guesstimate, an indication of the cost of chemicals that we need to purify our water. So if there's going to be a cost, should there be a deal? If there's tariffs, if there's no deal. Give us, you know, just give us something that we can outline. Because I think that would give some reassurance for maybe some of the constituents that are coming to us that we have a model. We might not like you know, some of all of us, you know, depending on our political ideology and where we're coming from, may not like whatever the outcome is, but that we have a, a pathway and we know and understand uh, what is going to happen. Because I think it's like the supply chain, there's going to be disruption to the, the supply chain. But we also have, and this is where the, if this, at the end of this uh, transition, if there's no deal and we go over a cliff, um, then we have a parachute and it's called the, the protocol. You may not agree with that, but we do have a supply chain in the, uh, going down across uh, Ireland. So the EU and the Irish, in terms of whether it's some of the big, big supermarkets, may might have to go elsewhere. Some of the councils are saying to us, when, for instance, waste management, they may have to go and look at transporting that differently than what they currently do. And the protocol will help them do that. So I think it would help us to understand the kind of modelling that has taken place, uh, and I'm assuming being presented to yourselves in the event of a deal, the event of an ODIN, and in front of maybe the implications of some kind of deal. And I think that's information that across all of the committees uh, that would be helpful. 
So where it's appropriate, um, I'm happy enough for, for that information to uh, be shared. Obviously, there can be sensitivities around some of this um, information as well, but um, whatever we can provide to the committee, if there are specific requests that are made, uh, I'm more than happy for us to, to look at that and see how we can be helpful, because if in any way that provides even some clarity uh, to our businesses and citizens, I think that that is a, is a good thing. In relation to your earlier comment in regards to the uh, negotiations, um, yes, um, Various people may say different things at different times. I'm not saying all of that is, is worthless, um, but we are in the middle of a negotiation and sometimes people bare their teeth. Um, sometimes people um, send out messages uh, in order to bolster their own uh, opinion. Um, I understand you have uh, experience um, uh, for uh, a number of years as a, as a UK MEP, so you will have had some um, understanding uh, of that. Um, but I think you can, we can also you know, read too much into um, what the President-elect has said uh, as well, because it's certainly the case that there's nothing um, that he has said that the vast majority of people around this issue would have any uh, disagreement um, with. Nobody wants to see guards uh, at the border. We want to see good relations on this island, and we want to see good relations with the, with the rest of, of, of the UK as well. So uh, I don't think that that is, is any great uh, uh, encouragement, because it's the position that so many people share already. I won't bite, Gordon. <laughs> I, was, I, was hoping you, I was hoping you would. Oh, but Gordon, I knew what you were trying to do. <laughs> I just did think we were doing so well. Yeah, know, we were I doing know, so well there. Everybody out there would have known what Gordon was trying to do. <laughs> okay. Um, Christopher. Thank you. In, in 35 days' time or so, we'll see just how committed to best endeavours people were. In the meantime, the Internal Market Bill represents a backstop to their backstop. And that's why it's productive and useful, because the position that we had gotten ourselves into um, was a case of Northern Ireland, or is a case of Northern Ireland being used as a negotiating uh, chip, um, what have you. Secondly, Mr Chairman, can I say to you, it's the absolute right of the United Kingdom Government to protect the constitutional integrity and the internal trade arrangements of their own country, regardless of who's on Capitol Hill or who's in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And I think that in a, a world of free countries, that has always to be the case, that people are entitled to make their own arrangements in terms of how they're governed, how they trade and how they operate. And it's intolerable that any country should be expected to erect an internal trade barrier on its own sovereign territory. And I hope that at the end of the period that we're in, uh, that that will not be the case. I now want to pivot completely away from um, all of this in terms of internal market bill, which has dominated the conversation, and raise an issue that was raised. I'm, I also serve in the Economy Committee. Um, in terms of business preparedness and allowing people uh, access to advice and, and stuff like that, I know that there has been a lot of work done there in terms of radio advertisements and, and advertisements and online NI business info and all of that. I'm just wondering, as we get closer and closer to the conclusion, is a calm strategy in place to just allow businesses to access advice and help and um, to enable them to be prepared for any outcome? I think, Christopher, we, uh, we need to ensure that that is in place. Uh, now, the Interdepartmental Working Group within TEO has an overarching responsibility to address readiness issues and also uh, for a scenario where there's no agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think that they need to have contingencies in place for all of that. The, the, the crux point I think you touch on is the importance of ensuring that all of our businesses have the necessary information. And I suspect that you, as well as I, know that there's a huge amount of uncertainty and fragility out there within our business community at this point in time. Mm -hmm. I was I was concerned uh, to to note that on the last occasion of the Business Engagement Forum on the 9th of November that uh, the business representatives present were still reporting at that stage concerns about the approach to engagement and communication um, and how fragmented it was. Now, that's coming to them in relation to providing reassurance with regard to 
uh, various uh, areas of business preparation, but what, what, what arose in that particular meeting were the concerns around VAT and accountancy yes. uh, issues and being properly scaled up to deal with uh, what's coming down the, the, the pipe. So I think the communications is at two levels. First of all, the Business Engagement Forum have done a number of meetings now. Uh, at the very outset, I actually did express uh, concern to the uh, NIO Minister in attendance that I thought that the nature of the presentation given to our manufacturers and our business people was much too fractured and fragmented. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, that hasn't been resolved. In some ways, it's handicapped as a result of the difficulties that we have been outlining to the committee on previous occasions. We don't have the information, therefore it can't be communicated. But uh, that needs a fix in relation to ensuring that small to medium-sized businesses know exactly how they are going to handle their books in 35, 40, 45 days' time. And then I think there is a need to ensure that in, in wider communication terms, media communication terms, that uh, they are all uh, being reassured that, that we have a grip on the situation and that as the information is bottomed out, that they know how to get access to that in a very timely way. So I think there's two elements yeah. to what you're saying, but the communications is critical, both within the room and then in terms of ensuring that online, our business community and, uh, and the business sector generally <coughs> in all aspects are being properly equipped with the information that they need. I think what has happened is I think the first sort of two and a half months of this year, everybody was talking about Brexit and then we were just buried under the coronavirus avalanche and people are obviously still very much more, certainly in terms of public attention, is still very much more focused there. But whatever the outcome, I think it's really important that we are in a position where, you know, from day one, bang, people know what they're doing. They're getting clear, concise advice because I think actually the coronavirus um, pandemic has shown us, you know, even as, as regulations change and stuff, people end up chasing their tail because they just don't understand what's happening or in terms of business support and grants and stuff like that. So I think it's it's really, really important. I, I don't need a response. To, I just It's really, really important that from day one of whatever comes, the executive is in a place to give clear and decisive messaging and leadership. Yeah. Thank you. I suppose the only thing I would add into that is the Trader Support Service um, yes. is there and is in place. However, I think there has been concern about the low uptake um, yes. that there has uh, been. I think part of that, though, as well, is because businesses are saying, well, look, we don't know what it's going to look like in January and now anyway, so how can I really plan uh, and prepare for that? Um, there's also concerns over the, the scalability of the Trader Support Service and the fact that it's, it, it's not perhaps as um, suited to specialist um, customs declarations or SPS checks uh, as well, which is a bit of a, a, bit of a, a concern. Um, but I, I think it's absolutely right that we do provide when we have that information, uh, as much information um, to businesses as possible, they're seeking that clarity, which is why it's so important that we get that um, agreement in place as soon as possible so that then the implications of the protocol can be worked out as soon as possible. Because it's only when that's done that businesses will then have the certainty that they are, are looking for. And it would be uh, remiss of me not to, to comment on the member's um, first remark. He'll not be surprised to hear that I'm in total uh, agreement with him, a sensation which I'm sure many members across this committee are familiar with. Um, but I, I do get surprised so often uh, at the outrage that some people are showing towards the fact that Northern Ireland is part um, of the UK um, uh, internal market uh, and that its government wants to protect and enhance uh, its place uh, in it. But I'll be testing your patience, I think, Mr Chairman, if we talk on that issue any further. Yes, my patience and junior minister, they're very, very strong. <laughs> I'm going to move and ask if um, Emma, would you have a question you want to ask there? Yes, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, oh, indeed, yes. I'm never sure the wee myth but the doesn't seem to um, deactivate when I had it at times. Uh, thanks very much, Declan and Gordon, for presenting to us again this afternoon. And um, I've taken quite a bit out of the conversation thus far. I just wanted to ask a question around the issue of 
both immigration into the north um, that's happened up until this point and as we proceed down uh, out of the EU, how things are going to change uh, following January, um, with particular reference to cross-border workers and to, to frontier workers, the, the um, scheme that was announced by the British government, I think it was last month, and you might be aware of the letter that was written to the British Secretary of State on behalf of CAJ and a number of organisations, including STEP in New Yellen, um, just almost in mid-Ulster, um, and we have a, a, a bit of the of our constituency crosses the border or is, is on the border and we would have quite a number of cross-border workers and particularly the, the sectors of I suppose agri-food production and our food factories in Mid Ulster and a lot of healthcare workers that this is going to impact and there have been concerns raised around the British government's implementation of the scheme in sort of the tight time frame that um, they've provided the fact that they're they're not aware of exactly how many workers this is going to impact, and the worry that the messaging hasn't been targeted as it, as it should have been. And I'm just wondering what conversations you've had around that, and sort of following on from that, if we have any idea of how this is going to um, apply to because that there there isn't an alliance within the scheme for British citizens and we've seen with the Emmett Sousa case that all residents in the north and anyone that's born in the north is treated by the British government as British the implications that that's going to have for people that mightn't think of themselves as being impacted by this well I think you're touching on the permit scheme for frontier workers, Emma, that was that was introduced by the the British government, as I understand it, the withdrawal agreement itself yes. offered offered protections uh, for the the rights of uh, frontier workers, and there's there's quite a number uh, who, uh, who who this affects in in Ireland. I think I've read that it's as many as possibly. 30,000 people fall into the category of being frontier workers. So the scheme, as I understand it, was designed uh, to address uh, the, uh, the, the, the fact that those people will no longer be able to lean on the rights that they would have otherwise had as citizens of the, uh, the EU. But the problem is that there was not... I think the reason there is so, so much lack of clarity around that on behalf of organisations like CAJ and elsewhere is because there wasn't sufficient or any consultation carried out in relation to the operation of that particular scheme. That's the problem. Um, and in the absence of the, uh, the, the, the consultation, then those answers haven't been provided. So it actually leaves a casualty in, in, in the middle of the current situation. And I think we need to be very, very attentive, uh, particularly as we move through the next 30 uh, days and more, to ensure that uh, no citizens are caught on the wrong side of a right that was there previously having been removed, but no protections or contingencies to ensure that uh, they can continue to, uh, to work. On, on the, the broader issue of um, migrant, migrant workers, in the context of COVID, when you think of the pressures that our press, our sorry, our uh, our health service is under, given the uh, the large number of uh, of people who have come here to populate our health service as nurses, as doctors, as uh, as health practitioners, and given the pressures that's under, I mean the the resilience of our health system at the moment is on the floor. Our hospitals are under very very severe pressures. I don't think we can run a health service in the north of Ireland without being able to rely upon uh, that level of expertise and quality of health care. So we're back into the territory of, of perfect storm in, in terms of how COVID can overlap with uh, uh, EU withdrawal and, and the absence of agreement on some of these key issues. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah specific about engagement that we have had with the government uh, on this. Um, we've had quite a few Brexit meetings, but I, I don't re I don't remember that we've had any direct engagement on that. Though I'm sure it's happened either at FMD, FM level, or, or at official level. Um, though the Deputy First Minister myself did meet recently with the um, Equality Commission, 
uh, to discuss obviously the dedicated uh, mechanism um, that's within the uh, protocol and um, I believe they were in contact with the um, Secretary of State. I don't know if it's specifically around um, all of these issues, but certainly in terms of um, rights of citizens uh, more generally. Um, if you have any specific queries or concerns uh, around that, um, Mr Chairman, we'd be happy to, to accept those and chase those up, um, whether that's answers that we can get from within our own department or if we need to go to uh, HMG on that, we would be would be happy to provide that because we're we're talking about people he here and um, their jobs and their futures as well, and, and we want to be able to give as much clarity and certainty in that as possible. Okay, happy enough, Emma. Yeah, thank you. No, it, it was it was the permit scheme um, that I was referring to, and I suppose just because it, I think it puts a deadline of June or July that people have to have applied for it by. Um, and, and have to have met the criteria by, I think, the end of this year. So there's quite a time turnaround and with everything that's happened in 2020 and, you know, specifically, I suppose, I can make reference there to the fact that there's many people that this would apply to that are working in the health sector and are, I suppose, already overworked and under a significant pressure. And it is going to disproportionately impact upon the north because we do share the land border and that's why all of I suppose all of the implications of Brexit are going to be felt more keenly in the north of Ireland because we have this land border and because you know so many people live across that every day um, so that, that's that's why I wondered if there were specific conversations on, on the issue uh, in terms of you know our devolved administration thank you, thank you both for that Okay, thank you, Emma. I also detected that there might have been a suggestion the frontier worker you were worried about was those living in Dungannon going into Mid Ulster. Was that a, a little bit of concern there? Was was that something I noticed? But maybe that's for another day. Um, maybe I'll, I'll ask um, George. Do you have any questions there? No, I'm, I'm fine. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, Junior Ministers, thank you very much indeed. for You've stayed with us for quite a length of time today. You've given mm -hmm. us a lot of information to, to mull over. Um, it certainly does feel like that things are moving in some direction. I'm not sure if it knows which direction it's going in, but there does seem to be a bit more information that's flowing back and forth, and it is uh, good to receive that information and to chat it through with you. But thank you very much for your attendance here today. Thank you. Very thank welcome. You. Thank you. Okay, um, members, you'll be delighted to hear we've still a considerable amount of work to progress through, I'm afraid, so we will uh, move on as quickly as we can. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item 7, which is consideration of the draft report on the evidence received from local councils on the impact of the UK exit from the European Union. Um, the draft committee report on the evidence received uh, on the impact is at page 64 of the table papers. Now, the report do does not make recommendations. It simply sets out the main issues that were raised by the uh, councils. Um, if there are any typographical formatting errors, they will be amended at the proofing stage, so we don't need to worry ourselves if you find any of them. Um, can I ask, are there any amendments to the report as presented that members would wish to make? Report. Okay, that's that's a big step forward to moving quicker then. <laughs> so if there are no amendments <laughs> proposed, then uh, I can advise members that we'll now proceed through the report um, seeking the committee's formal agreement as it is drafted. Um, so first of all, if we can look at the title page committee powers and membership and table of contents. Can I put the question that the title page committee powers and membership and table of contents stand as part of the report? Yes. Okay, agreed. that's agreed. Um, there is the introduction section, which is paragraphs one to eight of the report. Our members Chair, given that the report doesn't come to any conclusion or, or make any recommendation, could I make a proposal that the committee embrace the report, uh, allow for the publication of the report in its entirety? Entirety. I think that's a very good report. I look to the clerk to see are we happy enough. Can we can we do that? Can we accept that? it in its full entirety? If you want to do it now, yes, yep. that's fine. Yep. So proposed. That's fine. So, and I record it in the minutes as each question then. Yep. So there's that's a proper fine. record. That's grand. What about page seventeen? I had you need to motion. 
And I'm assuming just, in, just for clarity. Can, just for clarity, that includes the motion that's there to go to the business office yep. for inclusion. Yep. 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 Skip another page. It's brilliant. Okay, <laughs> it's not over yet. Uh, forward work programme, page 555 of the meeting pack. Um, members, the officials have asked if the briefing on the historical institutional abuse uh, engagement with institutions, which was due on the 2nd of December, can be provided as a written briefing with an oral briefing to be scheduled in the new year when officials should be able to provide us with more detail. I I'm reading into that that they don't have enough information to give us anything, but they might have something in a few weeks' time and maybe are looking for a bit of a break in that, so we'll get a written update. Would that be okay? That's fine. Um, in that case, then, are members content to note the forward work programme? As long as we don't delay too much, because there I are know that's victim right. groups out there and individuals that are, that are yeah. waiting. Yeah. Early New Year. I think early, early in the New Year. We new record year. that so as just, early yeah. in the New Year. Yeah. Okay. Members, then, in terms of correspondence, um, there's seven items on the pack from page 562 to 600. Item 9.1 is a response from the First and Deputy First Minister to the Committee's request for information on what steps were being taken to secure uh, future funding for the Shared Future Funding Programme. Are you content to note that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Item 9.2 is correspondence from the Committee for the Economy asking if they could get a copy when re received of Minister Gove's response to the Committee request for written evidence. Are members happy that we do that? Of course. Yes. Sorry, uh -huh. And agree to send it to all. That oh, sorry, and there was an extra item, but maybe we will just forward that to all yeah. committees, Please, given yeah. that many yeah. of them will have some form of input yeah. into yeah. that. Yeah. Um, item 9.5 is a copy of the Northern Ireland Youth Forum, Our Voices Speaking Truth to Power. Uh, I had raised this issue last week and participated in a programme with them last Thursday evening uh, in my capacity as an MLA. Uh, is it okay if we schedule a presentation from them early in the new year? Yes. Yep. Okay, item 9.6 is a written briefing from the Community Foundation Building Back Better public participation in Northern Ireland's post-COVID recovery. They have asked to present oral evidence to the committee. Um, could we maybe ask in the first instance if we write to the executive office and ask for their views on the document and then based on their views, that will inform what we would do then if yeah. we were going to have yeah. an oral briefing yeah. from them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Apologies, Chair, I have to leave. Oh, you're, well, you could have got away with another 20 seconds. <laughs> uh, Chairman's business, I have none. Any other business from members? Was there a report on? Sorry, go ahead, yeah. uh, Chair. Was there was there a report that there was going to, was going to be released tomorrow in relation to some findings on Irish unity in the paper? Yeah, Martina, that, that's the last letter that we have. Yeah, I can't hear me. Yes, yeah. Sorry, then my face pops up on the screen. That's really distracting when you're trying to talk. Um, <laughs> Uh, throws me off every time. Uh, there's a, a letter, the last letter in the pack is from that group that we're doing the uh, consultation on a referendum in Irish Unity, and I think they've invited us, they, they want to uh, present to the committee. Mm. Did they request? I didn't read that into no. it. Um, this was to a, a, a private, oh. inviting me to a private briefing. Oh, really? It wasn't addressed as committee. I put it in the um, in the papers just for transparency. Hmm. Um, but because I thought you might have got um, invitations yourselves as individual members. But as this stands, it's not for the committee. It was it was for me as clerk, and and that's the reason why it was put in the papers okay. just for transparency. Okay. Thank you. I thought it was for us. No, okay, no. Sure, maybe if we can keep an eye as members then to see if we can. We'd have liked to be invited. <laughs> Um, okay, well then, on that then we go to the date, time and place of the next meeting, which is this day next week. And on that, members, thank you very much for your attendance you. and participation today, and we'll bring the meeting to a close. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.